Very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this seventh session of Ayurveda conference. In this session, we have two speakers. The theme of this session is well-being of aged persons. As we all know, Manu has said, Abhivadan Shilasya Nityam Vridhopa Sevinaha Chatvari Tasya Vardhante Ayur Vidya Yasho Balam. One who takes care and pays respectful regards to the elderly persons, he gets four good results, and these are one of them is Ayu. He gets a long life, Vidya, knowledge, Yasha, his fame is spread across the world, and Balam. He becomes a strong person. So this word Vridhopasevinaha, this occurs in the Ayurveda Sanghita, Charak Sanghita also. Therefore, well-being of aged persons is also covered in Ayurveda. I am just inviting Dr. B. S. Prasad. His topic is holistic approach to delay the aging process. A brief introduction to Dr. B. S. Prasad is here. Dr. Prasad has an accomplished Ayurveda career reflecting 20 years of experience in various fields of Ayurveda like clinical practice with super specialization in male infertility, Ayurveda research, teaching, medicine, manufacturing and administration. All these he has been working upon. He has a PhD in Ayurveda from Gujarat Ayurveda University, Jamnagar. He has worked as lecturer in department of Sharira Kriya and Vikruti Vijjana in Alvaz Ayurveda Medical College, Mudabidri, Karnataka. Worked as assistant professor and head of the department Kaya Chikitsa in SDM College of Ayurveda and Hospital, Hassan, Karnataka for the period of two years. Worked as professor and head of the department Kaya Chikitsa in SDM College of Ayurveda and Hospital. Also worked as professor and HOD PG Department of Panchakarma in charge, Central Research Library, Andrologist, Vaji Karana Speciality at SDM College of Ayurveda and Hospital. Presently working as principal KLEU Shri BMK Ayurveda Mahavidyalaya, Medical Director KLE Ayurveda Hospital and KLE Society's Ayurveda Pharmacy, Belgaon. I invite you, Dr. Prasad, for your presentation of 30 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of question answer. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Here is a small correction. Now, my present position uh, is not the principal of the KLE Ayurveda College. Now, presently, I am President, Board of Ayurveda in National Commission for Any System of Medicine. In the okay. Ministry of Ayush, uh, presently I'm working here. Uh, anyway, so uh, I'm at the outset. I'm thankful for the organizers for giving me an opportunity. And of course, I was uh, kept very busy, but I'm not able to communicate well with the organizers. There was a communication gap was there. I have a lot of uh, commitments. I was able to continue. And anyway, so today's topics I'll be presenting on the holistic approach how we can delay the aging process. Uh, can I share my slides? Yes, okay. Yes, you can share, Dr. Prasad. Yes, uh, they are visible now? Yeah, they are visible. Okay. So, this is a holistic approach to delay the aging process. And... Uh, let me brief a little bit, very briefly about the background of the process so that I can take it to Ayurvedic concepts later on. The uh, aging process is a physiological process and uh, there's a intrinsic features of all living beings. Every living being has to undergo aging process. And then this occurs heterogeneously across cells and tissues, the human body. And uh, different cells will undergo into aging process at different timings. Everything will not go on only one time and uh, one mechanism. 
And rate of aging is not the same in all human beings also. And some people will get very early aging. And some people will delay the show the aging process. Likewise, we can see the lot of the uh, varieties in the attainment of aging also. And hence, the biological age will be many times it may differ to the chronological age. Uh, these are the few of the aspects of the aging process. And when you look to the factors responsible for aging, we have, as I told already, multifactorial. And the genetic factors is a time factor where the age advances. Then only after a certain age, it starts and going on advancing. Environmental factors, hormonal imbalances, chronic illnesses, lifestyle disorders, mental health problems, social factors, this all influence the aging process. The, even a social factors also, the family issues also, and mental strength, how strength is, how, how mentally is strong, that also makes him the, uh, the aging process will influence. Likewise, and all these ones uh, will lead to the senescence of the uh, stem cells. Ultimately, we have stem cells at different levels of the body. And the, these stem cells, if they stop replicating or if they undergo senescence, then we start showing aging process. So these senescence may be triggered by oxidative stress or the telomere damage. And as I shown here, the telomere length, the damage of the uh, telomere. So that shows again the senescence, the DNA damage, mitochondrial dysfunction or chromatin disruption, inflammation, of the or immune disorders or epigenetic dis dysregulations and oncogenic activation. So likewise, this all the various mechanisms are various uh, triggering factors which uh, trigger the stem cells to undergo into senescence so that they will not replicate or even they replicate, they'll be in the defective manner that will be there. So this way, the aging process may be initiated. Uh, so ultimately, all these causative factors we can summarize into one is intrinsic and extrinsic factors. One is intrinsic the inside cells, the stem cells, what is happening inside the genetic damage or DNA damage, the mitochondrial inactivity or defective, likewise, what all things are there inside the cell, there are a few things are there. And then outside the cells, niche, the stem cell niche, so this also will interfere the, the cell, the stem cell proliferation. What is there are a lot of uh, vascular networks are there, different cells are there surrounding those stem cells will be there. They're all secrete various the, uh, chemical agents are there. So they all will form into a, a micro environment around the stem cells. So these are all the different things which are all there around the stem cells. They, what are the collections are there, they form into an environment. So that environment will influence the, the stem cell activity. So if this environment is not favorable, Definitely, there is a cellular changes happens, the cell replication also will affect it. In that way, even not only the DNA or genetic content inside the cell, but outside the cell also very important. Where the we Ayurveda says the Prakriti Purusha concept also will work on the, what's mentioning here. So even uh, there are uh, several studies revealed that is uh, even the immunological process. These uh, cytokines also produce it, maybe interleukin 1, interleukin 6, or 8, whatever the interleukins are there, they also will interfere the this uh, stem cell replication and then they will minimize the uh, proliferation else. <clears throat> Likewise, this all uh, including immunological uh, uh, problems, there are several factors are there. So whatever the stem cell defects produced by immunological problems, we call them as inflammaging, inflamed aging. This is also there is a different term called inflamed aging. That is the aging process initiated by the immune mechanism or immune defects. Now this is the background. Now we understood that there is an aging factor is there, physiological phenomena, and then there is a multifactorial problems are there. And then the genetic intrinsic factors to the extrinsic factors, there are several factors play a role in the, the induction or the initiation of the aging process. Now coming to Ayurveda, what Ayurveda says, Ayurveda called Jera, that means aging is a phase of life and physiological manifestation. It's called as Sahaja Vyadhi, Sahaja Vyadhi is natural phenomenon. The end phase, Valyavastha, uh, Yavanavastha, Vruddhavastha. There is a phase of there. It is a phase wise manifestation and the physiological manifestation, the jara is there. And then this manifestation may happen in two uh, times or two forms. One is Kalakruta and Akalakruta. That is timely manifestation 
or and then untimely manifestation. As we told, some people get in the same, for example, 70 years, they should start showing aging process and going on. And there are some people will by 50 years, they shall show, start showing aging process. And uh, some people by after 80 years, they will be looking young only. Likewise, untimely also, these are both are there here, Kalakruta and Akalakruta. So then, then we have biological age process to chronological age else will happen. And when you, uh, we have some uh, physiological variations in Ayurveda mentioned for aging process. We can see the factors here and then early aging, delayed aging. According to the Prakriti, all of you know that genetic constitution where Pitta Prakriti and Vata Prakriti, they are prone for early aging and Kapha Prakriti, they are prone for delayed aging. They can resist the aging process. Similarly, Sara is tissue excellency. Each individual may have one type of tissue excellence, maybe Rasadhatu, Raktadhatu, Mamsadhatu. Likewise, depending on the tissue excellency, they call as Sara Purusha, which Sara they bear, they have abundance or excellency. So here, our Sara is, that means they don't have any uh, one particular Sara predominance. Almost all the tissue Saras are weak in them. So they call our Sara. They are prone for early aging. Whereas here, Sarvasara, all tissues are in excellent position. Or Mamsasara, they have muscle tissue abundance. And then our excellency, Astisara, Majjasara. So these four varieties of Sara people, they also resist the aging process. They have delayed aging processing. And then Satmiya, the compatibility. There are people who are compatible for everything. They can go, they can eat anything. They can go to any, any area, any temperate uh, climatic conditions, they can be able to sustain. Such people, again, they have delayed uh, aging process. Whereas the people who have incompatibilities, food, food incompatibility, then environmental incompatibility, so such people, they prone for early aging process. And then sattva, mental strength, as already mentioned, the strong uh, mental people will can delay the aging process, whereas the people who are very weak or the uh, people are mentally they are not very strong, who can't sustain the stress and strain and all uh, every reactions easily they are prone for it. So they show early aging process there. So these are the physiological variations in the aging itself. I have identified these factors. Now coming to determining and influence factors of lifespan. So lifespan determining factors one is the proper coordination between Daiva and Purushakara. This is the uh, lifespan is uh, decided by who is Daiva. The God, the God decides which, that means intrinsic factors. The genetic factors and DNA factors are there. So those comes as a Daiva part of it one. And Purushakara, the deeds after the individual performs. So these two, a coordination between both of them will decide the lifespan. They give a very good example. The how a vehicle, if improperly, maintained or improperly used it and improperly maintained vehicle will have early destruction. Suppose we purchase a vehicle, it have 10 years life, uh, is the life of the vehicle. If we don't use appropriately as per the company given the instructions, SOPs, then the life, the life of the vehicle will be early, maybe eight years, seven years, six years, it will be getting damaged link. Similarly, Though life is a human being, life is the God decides, maybe 60 or 70 or 80 years, whatever, 100 years, whatever things are there. But if we don't uh, appropriately follow the good lifestyle, that means either overstrain or eating in excess or irregularly, irregular postures of the body, Bhutabhishanga, the infections and infestations are there, and then exposure to poison, wind, fire, injuries, avoidance of food and medicines, or if a disease uh, got disease but not treated appropriately, then by all means, the lifespan will decrease also. That means here, the aging process will advance very fastly. Not only life means not suddenly. What am I even, my, uh, mean to say is, the even delay uh, aging process also will be hastened here. So in this way, Ayurveda has clearly mentioned how we have to follow it for delaying also. Then how to delay the aging process? Now, so we need to <clears throat> think of how we can delay the aging process. One is, Reversal of stem cell senescence and restoring the enhancing of stem cell proliferation. As I told, so what are the changes that are happening? These are because of stem cells are losing their uh, replication capacity or proliferation capacity so that with the individual is getting aging symptoms are there. When the stem cells lose their proliferation capacity, naturally the cell number will decrease and then they, there is the, what they call shithilata, shlatata, etc. will be noticed. Where the individual getting 
de de uh, decreasing all the aging symptoms are seen there so then holistic approach what we can do here one is rasayana i'll go to explain what is rasayana and explain and then uh, periodical abhyanga abhyanga has been given very uh, good effects and even stem cell proliferation also there so it is going to restore many of the physiological activities are there so aging process can be delayed by abhyanga is very very important so such individuals can be told monthly once abhyanga i go eat so likewise you can have a being then russian vajikar bastis because all russian vajikar drugs are rasayanas they have high rejuvenation capacity or proliferation capacity are there so these bastis we can select uh, one of the bastis vrishikar or vajikar bastis that can be administered for the selected individuals whom so it is required not everyone and then lifestyle and diet is very important that is the major part which we need to, to deal and then yoga pranayama and spirituality and then spirituality is important here and then the counseling so these are the uh, approaches which we need to collectively plan then only you may able to contract the aging process from all the angles otherwise we may not able to have the multifactorial or multi dimensional approach cannot be attained in the delaying the aging process i'll be dealing one now we can see the uh, screening of the as i told stem cells we can restore the sinus i'm telling the we can see the screening of proliferative activity of human peripheral molecular cells of varuna sariva gokshura and punar navadika options so there was a study how the, the to look the proliferative activity of these drugs they these are uh, working in the urinary system rejuvenators like the sign of what urinary system so there were uh, molecular cells were taken out and then they were studied with the proliferation capacity you can see with this one here this is the control one on day one these are the concentrations different different concentrations were given and you can see the shatavari varuna gokshura punarnava they have high they shown high proliferation of stem cells they have taken from the body uh, so we did day one also and day three also they see similarly they have shown it of course this is unpublished data but the laboratory data and then the different concentrations again they shown it the high proliferation in capacity control that one so this way uh, even the rasayanal drugs they show the proliferation high capacity proliferation of course they have selectivity again because if we have the uh, pluripotent then multipotent or unipotent oligopotent so depending on that uh, rasayanal drugs which have specificity those particular stem cells will be they enhanced it there not every rasayana will work on every uh, stem cells similarly uh, even the as i mentioned yoga and pranayama the practice of yoga seems to facilitate reverse of uh, aging through increased telomere length as i mentioned already telomere length is one of the factor that can show the aging process so here yoga found to increase the telomere length and yoga and meditation positively affect the cellular aging as this is one study and then oils from basil and the other ones they are, they are shown to increasing apparently length of the telomeres in cell culture and further a gene expression analysis revealed and then uh, the uh, down regulation of the uh, tumor uh, gene the regulation there so this sometimes ayurveda also mentions then several factors as a russian rasayana also even the uh, good smell the fragrance again have a good effect on the russia rasayan so likewise here this is a proven the different oils the volatile oils also found to have increased the telomere length and they also suppress the down uh, suppressing or down regulation of the tumor gene the tumor gene cells so that way they also have its own effect on the uh, the aging process because even in the aging process the activation of the tumor uh, so, uh, gene cells are important are those things apart from the uh, defective activity of the stem cells again tumor uh, gene cells will be activated there and now coming to the rasayana the rasayana is a very broad concept it may be immunomodulatory it may be a stem cell proliferator it may be functional capacity enhancer of the cells likewise you have multi dimensional activities there we cannot equate any one single term for rasayana including geriatric cells geriatric medicine cells nutraceutic cells so we have this is a multi dimensional approach is there for rasayana so here i when come to the uh, geriatrics application or in the terms of prevention of the aging process we have two types of aspects here we have to think of one is in particular to the any specific illness 
or the need and then in general vayasthapan that means individual having some for example somebody having respiratory problem he has to be treated that respiratory problem otherwise as i mentioned there chronic illness is going to hasten the aging process so we need to uh, minimize the effect of that or contract the effect of the respiratory defects or some other defects are there and then we are going to we are going to delay on the aging process we have to parallelly act on two aspects one is specific disease specific conditions even hepatobiliary gat whatever things are there concern that one or some people have memory loss etc they are prone for memory loss they having etc so we need to have that uh, major sign also and then here respiratory may people for example parangi exam for example urinary system have problems there as i told here varuna gokshala punarnama those things can be selected likewise specific illness to the specific rasana to be selected one part and second one is to minimize the aging uh, delay the aging process by sthapana drugs to be selected here so by sthapana means here the i will uh, give the definition here anyway the healthy living or healthy life for complete span of life by maintaining youthness that is the definition given for vai sthapana or arresting the aging process that is stabilizing the aging process that is the vai sthapana here it is also called aishkara dirghayu tarunyam tarunyam means youngness youth youthfulness to be maintained so this is the synonyms or the effects given for vai sthapana and the specificity the specialty is here these rasayana to be started at a before age of 60 years that means before the cell stem cell start senescence so they are going to undergo senescence process so then before they, we have to start it and sometimes the senescence start may be irreversible then even if you give rasayana it is of no use so that way they identified the right age and then they told before this age you have to start it then only you are going to get the vaisthapana effect so these vaisthapana drugs are to be started before the age of 60 years then only you may able to um, attain the the objectivity of the this vaisthapana rasayan so now the vaisthapana i am giving here uh, some details healthy living for full span of life that is 100 years while maintaining youthfulness so that is the definition for the vaisthapana varshitam ayu sthapanam vaisthapanam tarunyam bahukalam sthapayati iti so to maintain the youthfulness for more uh, prolonged time so that way it has been uh, given the vaisthapana different dimensions here so these are the few of the drugs amruta abhaya dhatri jeevanti shatavari vandukrupati sharaparni punarnava so these are the drugs coming under vaisthapana and the this is the latin names and family etc so they are also studied for different purposes but now there is a study the, these the drugs are shown to uh, increase the telomere length and also minimize the telomere damage also they were studied they uh, some of the rasayan and drugs they have studied and they published it the potential anti aging ayurveda medicines with the telomere protective and dna repair effects are there so these drugs are being shown and now shalaparni found to um, exert effect on uh, methylene process methylene process again the dna damage and the where the dna is going to be uh, switching of the genes some of the genes some some other uh, proteins will or some the molecules will attack the dna and then leading to the switching of the genes so this here there is a reversal of the effect as you can be seen by shalaparni and then shalaparni churnam showed statistically insignificant but it is a result was there improving telomere length human blood molecular nuclear cells are there so these two studies shows the it is a shalaparni one of the vaisthapana drug it is going to prevent the telomere damage as well as methylation process also that means the, these drugs are restoring the proliferation capacity as well as correcting the genetic or the genetic defects or dna defects going to happen that one so that way they both are uh, this drug is found to be very effective in uh, methylation uh, reversal and also to maintain the uh, telomere length also and these are the vaisthapana drugs they shown on uh, cell proliferation capacity now this is the punarnava and then uh, amlaki then here uh, maybe shatavari here the sp here i mentioned here uh, shalaparni sp shalaparni sp shatavari and then the mp mandukaparni here and then guruchi and then haritaki and jivan so these are the drugs on the vaisthapana gana you can see the proliferation 
of course, it is a dose dependent. On different dosage, they have different different effects are there. So we need to have optimum dosage for the good effects of it. But every drug has shown a very good proliferation of the the stem cells here. So that way, they are given almost all drugs. There is no uh, one single drug which has not shown any proliferation, but only dose variations are there. So that way, the optimum dose is very important when you want to give the rasayana for vaisthapana. Then these are the effects which we can see there. Now, what is the implementation strategy? Now, we know that there are the rasayanas that can uh, enhance the proliferation of the stem cell capacity. There are rasayanas to contract any specific, in a specific uh, organ, a specific system, defects are there. And then we have to have a good lifestyle and all these ones, uh, the, the effects are uh, even yoga and pranayama also found to reversal the genetic damages. So when all these are there, then how we have to approach to minimize or delay the aging process. What we mentioned is to be planned before the age of 60 years. There's a one first principle we have to understand, we have to remember it. And then design suitable lifestyle incorporating. We have to design a suitable lifestyle with incorporating a suitable yoga. That means there are people who cannot again do all yoga asanas. So as per their suitability, flexibility, age, etc., we need to de uh, define standing asana, balancing asana, sitting asana, prone posture, the supine posture, whatever the possible. So those we have to uh, design for them. And then pranayama, again pranayama protocol we have to uh, design within that uh, lifestyle and diet regimen also. And then as per the Prakriti Sara, his uh, energy consumption, his activities, depending on that one, we need to have the diet, uh, the planning should be required. And then spiritual activity. So this always gives positive mental health. Now, because of the nuclear families, they are deprived of the, the family the members, the uh, 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 attachment. That is the major problem which they are facing that one. So this spiritual involvement will definitely give a positive mental strength for them. So as per their religion, etc., their vision will, we can plan them spiritual activity. And again, group activity to overcome from the loneliness, etc. We should have the group activities periodically. So when, when you have a lifestyle in this manner, the weekly ones they have one satsanga type, or weekly one they have one small uh, gathering. Likewise, we can, we need to think of uh, the lifestyle. Then automatically we can able to contract other factors also as the social factors, their mental factors also we can able to contract. And then assess the mental status and counseling as required. We need to have the counseling part. We need to assess them and then which aspect we require to counsel. But everybody may not require counseling, but some people may require counseling. So that will be the, that we have to decide. And then again, as per the requirement, we can have multiple sessions as can be planned to see that they can be think in a positive way. Otherwise, whatever diet you give is of no use when the mentally they are not stabilizing, they are uh, sound enough out there. And then specific rasayana and its dosage form as required. Here, Rasayana and dosage form is important here. We want to give Avaleha, we want to give Churna, or you want to give Truta form. They are very important there, not only the drug there. For example, now, a person is of the obese and then the, uh, which case clean the thumb, the, uh, just like water body is there. For them, Churna will be ideal. Our Aswarista may be ideal for them. Our person is thin and lean, a very dry body, a Truta form is important for him. Or with thin only nourishment is required, but the avaleha form is required. Likewise, even the dosage form is important depending on the, the physical or the stature of the body also. Similarly, Vaisthapana Rasayana. Again, this also after having specific Rasayanas as for specific problem, then you can go for Vaisthapana Rasayana. Again, the dosage form is important. Either you want to give in the Gruta form or decoction form or Aswarista form, Avaleha form, that is also important as per the body condition to be selected. When once these are all totally tailor made, the plan is there, then it can be administered, then definitely it may be working in the tank. To summarize, uh, Jaram is a Sahaja Vya, that is aging is Sahaja, a physiological, and is a multi multifactorial. There are factors on the, that will fasten the process or delay the aging process also. And Rasayana, Vaisthapana, specified as anti-aging, how to be uh, contract the several factors of aging process. Then holistic approach with the lifestyle, diet, yoga, pranayama, spirituality, and Vaisthapana Rasayana. You definitely will arrest or minimize or reverse the aging process. So this is the, uh, with this I conclude. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh,
giving me the opportunity to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Prasad. As uh, you already said, you are very busy being the president of board NICSM, Board of Ayurveda in the Ministry of Ayush. I think you are the right person for carrying this message forward for Ayurveda, holistic well-being of the world. That is what we are aspiring to propagate and your papers on the specific topic, holistic approach to delay the aging process. I'm sure this will attract many people towards Ayurveda if this is publicized. Now the paper is open for questions or comments, observations. Shall I share it? Yeah, please. Yes, yes, I'm finding their options. Right. The option is at the top of the screen, please. Oh, grid you is there. I'm not expanding. Can't find it. Even this cell song. You want to share other? No, you go close. Can over here. You have to close your screen, please. That's what I'm trying. Stop sharing. Yeah, now it's done. I think it's done now. Mm -hmm. No, but again, you have to stop sharing now. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, yes please. Please, please, oh, please. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the very excellent lecture. And I think this is very much uh, something that is um, uh, important uh, also from, um, you know, in, uh, from Western medicine also when we think of it. I think, uh, you know, incorporating traditional uh, values and um, medicine is so important, especially as we talk not only about treating disease, but of general wellness and well-being and anti-aging. I was interested to know why was that cutoff of 60 years put? Is there a special reason um, of that age or uh, is that also possible after the age of 60? Or is it better to start this very early um, when people are in their 30s and 40s? And is there any difference based on gender? Uh, between men and women. Yes, uh, it, uh, Charaka, when he specifies the phase of age, phase of the human being, Balya is a childhood, then a, a youthless, then old age. Old age starts from the 60 years onwards, Rudhapya, 60 years. That means when we see the scientifically, the stem cells start losing their replication capacity, then aging starts. So probably they have identified that one, and so that before it starts uh, deficiency or stem cells uh, getting damaged, before that, better to start the, the Rasayana so that the stem cells can be restored, the proliferation capacity multiplied in a prolonged time. So as the definition of Vaisthapana mentions, Tarunyam Bhokalam Sthapayatiti, that means maintain the youthfulness for a prolonged time. So that means that there is a purpose of this Vaisthapana drugs are there. So that means unless until these drugs maintain the replication capacity of stem cells for a long time. You can't maintain the youthness. So definitely they might have identified that uh, stage where the stem cells are going undergoing damage so that before that you start it so that the stem cells will not undergo damage and then they will not lose the replication capacity or proliferation capacity so you can maintain the youthness for a long time. So that may be the reason for that one. As per my knowledge, I will tell it. Is there, any, is there any difference between, uh, thank you very much. Is there any difference between male and female or there's uh, no uh, general difference? No, it was not given any male, female. It is uh, commonly for 60 years is the uh, attainment of uh, the aging process by 60 years. One, one, can I ask one more question? Yes, please. 
Okay, the other thing is that um, I think many of the diseases that we have today are because of inflammation. So, uh, yes. there's something that you would say is, uh, in this is actually also acting as an anti-inflammatory agent, like for example, ashwagandha or something yes. like that. Those kind of are, I mean, from an anti-inflammatory because they probably are very important also for uh, maintaining well-being as well as for um, these uh, preventing these inflammatory diseases. Correct, correct. So as I told, uh, when the uh, Rasayana, when the definition I was defining, I told it is a multifactorial, multidimensional, including immune system and immunomodulatory as Even Ashwagandha, Bala, even Guruchi, uh, even Papikachu, they're all proven to have immunomodulatory effect on different, for example, uh, Guruchi and IgG is very effective. The uh, Ashwagandha, IgM, Ig, uh, Ig, uh, uh, IgM especially, and then uh, Guruchi, IgG also. And uh, I'm lucky IgA. Likewise, they have very specific to anti the immunoglobulin. They are very effective. Likewise, these rasayanas definitely work as a immunomodulatory also, and the definitely we were counteracting on the immune system also. And way that effect will be minimized. That way, I will give two concepts. One is the specific to uh, need of the problem, and then my stuff. These two we have to run parallel. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasad, and thank you, Professor Ruby Pavankar. We have been talking of integrating medicines since morning and since yesterday. So here was a good example. Professor Ruby Pavankar is a allopathic medical doctor, and she will be speaking in a while after this session. And she was raising the questions. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Very we nice. now move on to the next speaker, and she is not an Ayurveda specialist. But as I mentioned yesterday, she is working in the area of gerontology and has been giving the different talks on this topic of aging. So I invited her to join and present a paper in this conference of Ayurveda because this is a, a side event of T20, part of G20 presidency. I in, introduced Dr. Mala Kapoor Shankar Das. She is a sociologist, gerontologist, health and development social scientist, independent consultant with national and international organizations, including UN. She is international tutor, International Institute on Aging, United Nations. She retired as senior faculty from University of Delhi and serves as guest lecturer at Universitas Respati, Indonesia. Invited lecturer at PhD program, University of Macereta, Italy. She has been member of several committees on aging consortium for Asia Pacific, life member of Indian Sociological Society, Indian Association for the Study of Population, Indian Association for Social Sciences and Health, member of Global Alliance for Rights of Older People, and governing body member Alzheimer's Related Society of India, Delhi chapter. She has several publications to her credit in this field, and she will be speaking on the topic, approach of Ayurveda towards healthy aging. Welcome Mala for 30 minutes speech and then 10 minutes of question answer. Dr. Mala Kapoor Shankar Das. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes, yes, yes we, we can. can. Yes. So, namaskar to all the dignitaries from the government, the medical practitioners, and the scholars of Indian sciences and philosophy, as well as to everyone part of this August gathering, and especially to the organizers from the different esteemed institutions. At the outset, I'm grateful for the opportunity to bring my thoughts as a health social scientist and a gerontologist to this platform. And I thank Professor Shashi Prabhakumar for organizing this important national conference and involving me as a speaker to deliberate on relevance of Ayurveda for the well being of older adults, for whom I've been working since last three decades from a policy, theoretical, and pragmatic perspective by using my disciplinary knowledge of sociology and gerontology. Based on this specialization 
Uh, today, I present my discourse on well-being of aged persons by keeping in the background the important socio-demographic and epidemiological reality of societies in the 21st century, which are marked with rapid growth of aging populations who are experiencing the burden of both communicable and non-communicable diseases drastically affecting their well-being. Recent available Indian data states that 23% of the uh, global burden of disease is attributable uh, to disorders in people aged 60 years and older. The longitudinal aging study in India, LASI, a very significant data collection exercise being conducted by the Ministry of Health indicates that the prevalence of communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases among older adults in India is almost 25% uh, and 46% respectively. Experts are extremely worried with the challenges that data on diseases presents and they see this also as an opportunity for health policy and practice to address the health needs of older people, and especially from indigenous medical knowledge available in the country, which can promote healthy aging and also enhance longevity. As I don't know how many of you are aware that India ranks low compared to many of the Asia Pacific countries, and of course to Europe and America, in terms of life expectancy, both at birth and at age 60, as well as there are gender variations. Further, a matter of concern is that life expectancy differs in various states of India, and we need to address these aspects through our health systems, which can cater to needs of all citizens of India. Gerontologists realize that not only are older people being affected by various health parameters that impact quality of life issues, but families and communities are also facing repercussions of non-healthy practices and shorter lives. Addressing these dimensions calls for urgent thinking and putting in action appropriate available health responses in a medically and socially integrated way using local, sustainable, and cost-effective resources. In the light of various recent developments related to achieving sustainable development goals, realizing the aims of the universal health coverage, meeting targets for the decade of healthy aging, globally as well as part of respective country agendas. The emphasis is on holistic health frameworks that support populations in aging well. This is crucial as older people are an important group of stakeholders in the G20 summit since they represent a significant and growing proportion of the world's population. As per United Nations statistics, older people in the coming decades will more than double their share in the global population. Projections are that from 13% in 2017, it will be 25% by the middle of 21st century, just in three decades. However, while many remain active in later years, a substantial portion will have health issues. And to minimize this burden, it is crucial that self-care practices, health systems that have dependence on local resources be put in place. Older people are valuable contributors to the global economy, society, and environment but meeting their specific needs and challenges, especially related to health and well-being, requires urgent attention and action. Through this conference and as part of Voice for Aging Populations, 
who are important stakeholders in civil society, C20 engagement group, it is pertinent that the emphasis on holistic, lifelong health issues of older people are not undermined. I for years now have been advocating, sorry, sorry. There was a little uh, uh, connectivity problem. So I for years now have been advocating through my writings, activism and consultancies with UN and national agencies, the need to bring in an inclusive approach for social and health care of people by both gender and age lens. This is possible when in our thinking and work, we emphasize on the life course approach which provides a conceptual holistic understanding to many dimensions of lives, including health. Holistic health is a concept that considers the whole person and not just the physical symptoms or diseases. Holistic health and healthy aging approach means taking care of the physical, mental, social, and spiritual aspects of well-being as one ages. This approach can help older people to maintain their functional ability, independence, dignity, and quality of life in later years. Some of the benefits of holistic health in healthy aging approach are, it can help prevent and manage chronic diseases and comorbidities, enhance quality of life in later years, by using holistic approaches that balance the doshas, enhance the ojas, and employ resina herbs, the core elements of Ayurveda. Holistic health in healthy aging approach also further provides, which is crucial for us to realize, cost-effective and accessible healthcare solutions that are culturally acceptable and environmentally sustainable for longer lives. I do want to underline here that the world is realizing that holistic health important for well-being can be achieved by preserving and promoting the traditional knowledge of societies and wisdom of Ayurveda, which as I will soon highlight, does not only pertain as a practice to India alone, but provides holistic knowledge for well-being for the future generations in many countries across world religions, regions. Holistic approach using the concept of healthy aging can successfully meet physical, mental, social, and spiritual needs of individuals. And it promotes a life cycle approach that is the basis of living a long and healthy life. Healthy aging as a concept is popular in this century since it focuses on exercise, eating right, getting enough sleep, and socializing as part of a smart lifelong wellness program. Very acceptable in contemporary times. It provides a basis for regarding older populations as a resource, as a development asset, which is in tune with a right-based approach that is seen politically, economically, and socially correct globally as populations are aging. It thus contributes towards practicing holistic wellness and helps in achieving healthy aging. The crux of this holistic health approach to life is that it emphasizes the connection of the mind, body, and spirit with the goal of having everything functioning at its very best that, pivot, that pivotally contributes towards achieving maximum well-being. A key component to holistic approach is for individuals taking responsibility for their well-being and making everyday choices that put them in charge of their health. Therefore, in my this presentation, 
I highlight the intersectionality between the approach of Ayurveda and the concept of healthy aging, which is seen as a continuous process of op optimizing opportunities to maintain and improve physical and mental health, independence, and quality of life throughout the life course. I bring to discussions the significance of this as policy and practice directions, which we need to reflect on. The concept of healthy aging merges well with Ayurveda, which is not just a system of medicine, but an integral science of well-being for humans across ages. The Vata phase of life, starting around 50 or 60 years of age, as highlighted in classic Ayurveda texts, emphasizes on overcoming the range of physical and mental changes, which are set in by Vata, as it increases in the constitution of an individual. Understanding this phase of life calls for balancing Vata dosha by incorporating Ayurveda in our lives, by changing practices which hinder the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables well-being in older age. Such an approach is what WHO that is the World Health Organization recommends for healthy aging and encourages countries to have policies that enable all people to have ability to meet their basic needs, to remain mobile, active, managing their lives and valuing their contribution to society. Holistic wellness integrates all aspects of an older person's life, including health, social interactions, cognition, participation in activities, eating habits, and sleeping patterns, and very pertinently finding ways to take care of and improve upon these factors. It calls for action on the part of the individual, taking his, her holistic wellness in own hands by working on it each day. This is synonymous with the approach of Ayurveda, which as rightly said, is a way of life. The World Health Organization recognizes the importance of using Ayurveda for healthy aging and health-related conditions. In fact, the WHO has a global strategy on traditional complementary and integrative medicine that aims to promote the safe and effective use of these through regulation, research, and integration into health systems. I do want to stress that the importance of Ayurveda for global health is huge, as more and more people are seeking natural, holistic, and personalized approaches to health and wellness. As per my knowledge, while Ayurveda as a system of medicine is heavily practiced in India and Nepal, where around 80% of the population report using it. It is also recognized in Hungary, Switzerland, Cuba, and Brazil, besides in Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, UAE, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Malaysia, Mauritius, Siberia, and Tanzania. In many countries, Ayurveda is used as an interventional strategy from a preventive disease viewpoint than as a curative measure, thus seen as a cost effective and helpful in addressing health and well being issues of older people from a life course perspective. With regard to its ability for aging populations in different countries, Ayurveda offers several benefits for healthy aging and health-related conditions by preventing and managing chronic diseases, thus enhancing quality of life and well-being of older people. This is achieved through Ayurveda since it is based on the principle of balancing the three dosas, vata, pita, and kapha, and enhancing the ojas, vitality and immunity, through diet, lifestyle, herbs, and therapies. The relevance of this for older people lies in the fact that as a system and as a practice, 
It provides cost effective and accessible healthcare solutions by preserving parts of the body in a holistic sense. Using an Ayurveda approach can facilitate reaching the goal of healthy aging in the Vata stage by taking care of nutrition, body, remaining active physically and mentally, staying connected with the environment, opening mind to new learning to remain agile, and keeping both mind and body healthy. Ayurveda as a practice inculcates a habit of regularity, discipline, control, and understanding the needs of the body from a life course approach. There is an element of positivity in dealing with life through an understanding that connects the capacities of an individual with their environment. Being able to live in environments that support and maintain one's capacity and functional ability is the key to healthy aging. Ayurveda believes that diseases are caused by an imbalance of the three prime aspects, which relate to body, mind, and spirit. It recognizes that each person has a unique constitution or prakriti which determines the physical, mental, and emotional characteristics that can be disturbed by invasion of foreign agents or toxins transmitted through air, water, food, contact, or vectors, which lead to imbalance in the harmony of the body. Ayurveda suggests various preventive measures for dealing with communicable diseases from a healthy aging perspective which draw attention to maintaining personal hygiene and cleanliness of the surroundings, avoiding exposure to polluted or contaminated environments, following a healthy and balanced diet that suits one's prakriti and season, boosting one's immunity and vitality with herbs, spices, and rasayanas, which are the rejuvenating top, uh, tonics, practicing yoga, meditation, breathing exercises, and other forms of physical and mental exercise, adopting a positive and optimistic attitude towards life, and no less as emphasis on seeking timely advice and treatment if symptoms appear. Ayurveda has very clear directions towards various methods of diagnosis and treatment for communicable diseases. But since I'm not a practitioner of Ayurveda medicine, it would not be appropriate for me to comment on the different parikrishas, that is examinations required. And also many dimensions of these, some of the speakers have already covered. Nonetheless, what I am comfortable in commenting is that Ayurveda definitely helps in dealing with communicable diseases, in particular for older people who have many difficulties in accessing other medical services and provisions due to various constraints by providing them with natural and holistic solutions that are tailored to their specific needs and conditions. Ayurveda can also help in preventing the complications and comorbidities for all segments of the population that may arise due to communicable diseases. But however, for well-being of older people, it is particularly beneficial as harmful impacts of certain allopathic treatments, which can cause various set of complications in later years can be avoided. Ayurveda as an approach and its benefit benefits were seen quite effectively during the pandemic time witnessed recently. Various research reports published and also surveys conducted at grassroots levels by certain organizations and even my own research or with senior citizens associations show that Ayurveda as an approach towards healthy aging can be very effective means to manage disaster situations. And it can have positive impact on health and well being of older people, which during disasters, during crisis, is quite low. Studies indicated that 
Ayurveda helped reduce stress and anxiety among the population in times of disasters, various kinds of crises or uncertainties by using natural methods such as yoga, meditation, breathing exercises, massages, and herbal treatments to calm down, detoxify, and rejuvenate the body and mind. It also helped in preventing and managing chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, arthritis, obesity, and cancer. And this was particularly noticeable when many people could not go during pandemic time to seek medical care. In managing mental health concerns, which is an important component of well-being of older people, as much as it is for younger populations too, Ayurveda plays an important role and did so when people were homebound, going through various hardships because of the COVID pandemic. According to Ayurveda and quite similar to allopathic practice too, mental health issues are caused by the disturbance of the natural harmony of the mind and its attributes. So lots of mental health aspects were covered in the morning, so I will refrain from discussing this now. But all I want to do state is that the remedy lies in maintaining healthy life, emphasizing on physical and mental exercises, along with yoga and meditation, following a balanced diet and adopting a positive and optimistic attitude towards life, notwithstanding the need to seek timely medical advice and treatment if symptoms persist or worsen. Ayurveda reflects strong overtones of its power as healing mechanism and also as a promotive and preventive intervention with regard to mental health of older people. Research conducted on pandemic time indicated older people using Ayurveda as a practice to focus on eliminating the root cause of the disease rather than the symptoms. Senior citizens reported on using holistic approaches that balance the dosas, enhance the ojas, and employed use of rasana herbs. The healing foods pertaining to body specific needs for themselves and their families. It is very interesting to question how did this knowledge reach older people? Of course, many are familiar with Ayurveda traditions, but many learned through communications with well-wishers and the use of internet. This fact strongly supports the need to communicate about Ayurveda to the public. Raising awareness on these traditions is absolutely necessary as it could help enhance the quality of life and well-being of older people by addressing their physical, mental, social, and spiritual needs. Ayurveda also offers anti-aging therapies that nourish the tissues, and we heard this also in the earlier section, improves the immunity and delays the degeneration process, a much desired outcome for communities that give much emphasis on youthfulness and bring in various age discriminatory practices. Its strength lies in the fact that it uses locally available resources, such as plants, minerals, animal products, and metals to prepare medicines that are safe and effective. As concluding remarks, I would like to state that use of Ayurveda approach Thus provides a holistic concept of health, which is the need of aging societies as life expectancies rise and vulnerabilities due to age related problems increase. It is essential in contemporary societies for all countries to adopt a framework that enables the rapidly growing number of older people to remain a resource to the families, communities and economies. As nations work towards achieving the goals of sustainable development and making the decade of healthy aging successful, it is pertinent that the principles of Ayurveda be used to maintain 
excellent physical and mental health in later years through a combination of nourishing diet, wholesome activities, and gentle herbs, the philosophy behind Rasayana in Ayurveda. Clearly, Ayurveda, one of the world's most authoritative mind, body, spirit, medicinal system, can offer deep understanding of the aging process by including various therapies for healthy aging. An understanding of the intersectionality between Ayurveda as an approach and the concept of healthy aging is an optimal medium for increasing healthy well-being and for lifespan in tune with nature. The negative impacts of aging, a cause of concern for people and governments, can be overcome by understanding the principles of Ayurveda and its role in the management of deterioration due to aging when increased susceptibility to various chronic and degenerative diseases happens. However, while Ayurveda is recommended as a holistic health system and more and more countries are getting inclined towards its practice, we should not ignore some of the global challenges for us which can affect its effectiveness and promotion as a medium for healthy aging and holistic healthy fra well-being framework. In this regard, I want to bring to your attention that we need to criti critically review its success rate as a preventive and curative approach by doing more research on its linkages with specific diseases and ailments affecting societies especially as people age. It's gender neutrality in being physiologically effective. And for these assessments, there is need for governments to increase budgetary allowance, set up more research centers, have regulatory mechanisms in place for sale of products and control over misuse of ingredients and false practice claims. Globally, while Ayurveda as a means to achieve healthy aging and well-being is getting popular, certain concerns related to extinction of some medicinal herbs, poor quality of Ayurveda products, and low ethical values of manufacturers, with some resorting to adulteration and other malpractices by using toxic products such as lead, mercury, and arsenic metals, needs governance issues to be strengthened along with quality controls and appropriate pricing. Therefore, understanding, uh, therefore, notwithstanding putting in place accountably ethical practices, awareness generation, and regulatory mechanisms, I recommend some of the policy directions for use of Ayurveda as an approach for healthy aging as one, promoting awareness and education about the benefits of Ayurveda across cross-section of populations. Two, integrating Ayurveda with the mainstream healthcare system and ensuring its accessibility, affordability, and quality universally. Third, supporting research and development on Ayurveda for healthy aging and generating evidence-based data on its efficacy, safety, and cost effectiveness. In addition, it is necessary uh, encouraging collaboration and partnership among various stakeholders, such as government agencies, academic institutions, private sector, civil society, and international organizations to foster innovation and best practices in Ayurveda for healthy aging. Pertinently, developing standards and guidelines for the practice, education, regulation, and accreditation of Ayurveda for healthy aging is absolutely essential. My final concluding comment voices out the strengths and benefits of Ayurveda, not only as a system of medicine, but as an approach towards well-being of older people through practical measures that prevent premature aging and slow down age-related declines in body and mind, which hamper healthy aging, not only for the present cohorts of older people, 
but also for future generations by respecting diversity of cultures and traditions that influence its practice. The morbidity and mortality related to aging is a big cause of global uh, concern. And the Indian system of practice of Ayurveda with its patient centric and holistic approach can be a means to deal with negativity related to aging and stress on healthy aging as a goal for better quality of older people for achieving their well-being. It aspires to achieve universal health coverage through value-based health care by, in many ways, removing vulnerabilities and disparities of existing health care systems. And very significantly, from the G20 summit point of view and part of global health agenda, I summarize the benefits of Ayurveda by improving well-being for older people in three ways. One, it can address challenges of demand and rising costs for healthcare services, as well as of declining workforce participation by helping in increasing and maintaining their functional ability, independence by providing holistic personalized care as per their needs. Second, can foster intercultural dialogue and cooperation among societies for universal and global responses to aging. And third, very significantly, uh, can contribute towards the achievement of sustainable development goals, especially goal number three, 10, 12, 13, 17, relating to good health and well being by improving access to services to reducing inequalities and health disparities. In bringing responsible consumption and production practices by promoting sustainable use of natural resources, contribute towards climate action by mitigating impact of climate change on health of people across ages and strengthen partnerships for achieving these goals. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you so much, Dr. Marla Kapoor. Now her paper is open for discussion, comments. We have seven minutes for question answers. Uh, yeah, please. Well, this is a very, very nice presentation and you have made the very... Sorry, can you speak a little louder? I'm not able to hear. Is there a problem? I can't hear. I think it is on mute. Yeah, I couldn't hear anything. About it. Ah. Should I direct yes. myself there? Yes. So, no. So, Bhasmas have played havoc uh, with, uh, you know, kidney problems and many of the diseases. So, I think this is an urgent matter that all the drugs which are used by Ayurvedic physicians should immediately, urgently be tested for their safety and efficacy. And uh, you have very well pointed out about uh, uh, regulatory bodies and regulations that must be done as it is being done for allopathic medicines. And uh, many of the Ayurvedic practitioners 
uh, I have myself found that they use mostly allopathic medicines and they are, wor they are working in allopathic hospitals and uh, they are given, you know, allopathic uh, chores and that they perform. And uh, uh, it's, it's very interesting that the Institute of Medical Sciences has a department of geriatric medicine which only looks at, you know, the problems of old people and uh, they do use yoga and uh, allied Ayurvedic practices uh, in that department. Uh, and uh, they address to diabetes, lifestyle and so many things. And it's a full-fledged, a good department. And I'm very happy that you talked about uh, regulation and accreditation. Thank you very much. This is my comment. Could you hear, Malam? Uh, I could hear uh, some parts of it. I don't know if something earlier was said. I uh, the missed. Same thing, the professor. Yeah, I, I repeat. I repeat. Professor Anand Kumar is a medical doctor, and he yeah. appreciated your presentation and especially the point that you made about accreditation and examination supervision of Ayurvedic drugs. So he was referring yes. to use of bhasma by some Ayurvedic doctors. So you have yes. to respond or comment anything? No, I feel that, uh, you know, while this uh, system of medicine and way of life is being promoted, uh, much more awareness needs to be generated on its practice, on uh, its uh, ethics and uh, on its accountability. I, I know of many people who claim to be Ayurvedic practitioners and uh, they don't really have degrees and they say, no, I know it all. My father did it, my mother did it, so and so and so. So I think uh, a lot of uh, awareness generation is required. And also like, you know, we uh, recommend use of yoga, we recommend use of diets, but many people do not know all the beneficiary and harmful effects of uh, certain products. Uh, even certain vegetables, even certain fruits, uh, their timing of eating, their impact on certain bodily functions, uh, their uh, seasonal availability, all these are very necessary for understanding. So it's not just to talk of Ayurveda as a system, but I think we need to break it up in terms of its what it com consists of and raise awareness on it. And uh, I think uh, some of the institutions which uh, um, provide practice of Ayurveda take this up in a very serious way. And something I maybe missed the point was something was being said about like um, Ames has a geriatric clinic and so forth. Many other colleges have started geriatric clinics. Everybody just says, oh, you meditate, oh, you do yoga. You know, what is the science behind all this needs to be understood. So I think uh, we need to look at Ayurveda from a very scientific perspective, from the lay public viewpoint, and not just uh, take it as something, kind of. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. B.S. Prasad and Dr. Mala Kapoor Shankar Das for this excellent session regarding well-being of aged persons. From this, we move on to women and child health. And we have a very distinguished participant. Again, she is not an Ayurveda expert, but she is a medical doctor dealing with pediatrics. And I will read her topic, Optimizing Health and Well-being for Women and Children, an Integrated Approach. And I'll briefly introduce her. First of all, she's also a co-chair of Task Force 3 under T20. And that is where I heard her and listened to her views on children's health. Therefore, I requested her to participate in this wonderful seminar on Ayurveda. And she readily agreed. She has been traveling, just reached Tokyo, and she has connected. She's executive director and immediate past president, Asia Pacific Association of Allergy, Asthma, 
and clinical immunology she served as president of apaa aaci president of world allergy organization wao and a council member of collegium international allergiolicum her academic affiliations include professor division of allergy department of pediatrics nippon medical school tokyo japan guest professor shows university school of medicine tokyo japan capital medical university beijing china and honorary professor china medical university taiwan professor pawankar is honorary fellow of the royal college of physicians steering committee focis and has held positions in many regional and global organizations she has been recognized with numerous awards she is editor of several books and peer reviewed journals she engages with global bodies like the un who unep especially on climate change and one health focuses on bringing science to action via public policy she was an expert panelist at united nations rio 20 biodiversity and health and has lectured at scientific meetings in over 60 countries i invite you professor ruby pavankar for your presentation on holist on this optimizing health and well being for women and children and integrated approach thank you very much professor sashi prabha uh, uh sashi prabha kumar and thank you for the kind invitation uh, for this uh, excellent meeting i wish i could have attended all of it but uh, due to commitments i just was able to hear the last two lectures but they were wonderful um i also am um grateful to all the organizers and all the collaborating uh, organizations for this for organizing such a wonderful event and as well as uh, for having me here and i look forward to continue these deliberations as we go forward so today what i'm going to talk to you about is also about um the environment and health and uh, women and children and of course what should be done and what can be done oh how do i go to the next okay i can go to the next slide oh it's only how do i go to the next slide okay you have to okay okay i just a minute i have to reduce the size okay i got it um do i do this for going forward or backward okay uh, i'm sorry i will operate ma'am you operate no but then I, if i if you operate i have to each time tell you that please change yes, the slide ma yes ma'am can i just can i do it myself it's easier you have to I'm share sorry. no can i you... can't share if you just give me the control i can do it you can't ma'am oh no Only i I've, i've done it before because you know my laptop doesn't uh, support webex so i've done it before okay can i have the next slide please um what i'd like to talk today about is an important aspect that we all uh, are well aware of about climate change and the environment and how this is affecting uh, human health basically because human health is not uh, isolated we cannot consider human health compartmentalized just as a human body because human health is interrelated with the environment the ecosystem the plants the animals and their health and any disruption in this can lead to a variety of uh, situations where including uh, the results of climate crisis as well as uh, uh, vector borne diseases as well as uh, zoonotic diseases like the most recent pandemic that we had uh, covid-19 so global epidemiological studies have shown that climate change reduced biodiversity indoor and outdoor air pollution and other forms of pollution which is uh, water and food uh, pollution all this including microplastic they affect health and especially the non communicable diseases and we know now that all these kind of environmental pollutants are also causing a leaky epithelium and this causes the 
um, these toxins to enter the human body and also uh, disrupt the microbiome, which is crucial in maintaining the human health. And I will come to that as we go further. And all this affects the work productivity. It affects mental health, as we heard in the excellent talks in preceding um, me, uh, and the health spends as well as the economics of the nation. And what are the health benefits of a natural world? And it is, it's incalculable because nature provides the clean, breathable air, drinkable water, and productive soils, as well as medicines and a buffer against zoonotic diseases. So we need to preserve that nature and to do climate mitigation. With planetary and human health at a crisis, all of these benefits are under threat and it's very important to have climate mitigation. Next slide, please. Again, we know when we talk about climate change, it's not just about uh, the pollution, it's about the wildfires, it's called the thunderstorms, it's called the sand and dust storms, the heat waves, and this you can see this happening all over the world, uh, floods and droughts, air and water, uh, food pollution, greenhouse gases, uh, biocontaminants and impact, and all this impact NCDs as well as communicable diseases. In addition to that, urbanization, lack of exercise, exposure to sunlight, um, decreased uh, exposure to biodiverse environments, including diverse diets, which is very, very important, a healthy diet and a diverse diet, increased overuse of antibiotics and increased hygiene have all created this uh, microbial dysbiosis and an immune dysregulation. And who are the vulnerable populations? The vulnerable populations are children, women, especially pregnant women, and the elderly, as you just heard, very two elegant uh, lectures on how we can actually uh, prevent aging or we can do a healthy aging. So these are the most affected people, the most vulnerable populations, and as well as people who have comorbidities, this is different non-communicable diseases. The next slide, please. So when we talk about this, there are environment and lifestyle risk factors, what we call as the exposome. And when you talk about the exposome, we have genetics. We know that genetics affect a wide variety of non-communicable diseases. And I would talk about allergic diseases as an example, as a prototype, because it's the earliest of all the non-communicable diseases to affect a child. You know, it's a young child is one year old, already has eczema, or even younger than that, uh, two months, three months, eczema, then food allergies, asthma, rhinitis is the first non-communicable disease that manifests in a child. Then you have pollutants, as I mentioned, outdoor and indoor pollution. You have loss of biodiversity. We have all this, as I already mentioned, urbanization, uh, lack of vitamin D, Western uh, diet. And then you have a disruption of the diversity and the composition of the microbiota in the human body. And these are further affected by C-section, cesarean section, by the overuse of antibiotics or the use of antibiotics in early life and certain dietary factors. The next one, please. So when we look at the trend of prevalence of some of these non-communicable, let's take asthma, for example, according to the gross domestic product. What is interesting is we are the people who are getting more and more affected. Because if you look at Europe and, and, and uh, US and Japan, these countries had a rise in these uh, uh, incidents of asthma some years back and plateaued and is kind of decreasing to some extent. Whereas countries in the Asia Pacific and industrializing countries, including India, Russia, China, and the countries in South Africa, they're actually getting the brunt of this as uh, the countries are becoming more economically st uh, strong and more industrialized. Next, next please. And we see this also with obesity. When you look at obesity, you see the same pattern. If you look at the left graph and the right graph, you can see as compared to the um, rise in obesity in your US and in um, uh, Europe, you can see this is increasing in Southeast Asia, is increasing in the African uh, subcontinent. So these developed as countries are getting industrialized, as countries are getting more westernized, you can see there's an increase in these non-communicable diseases. And I say this just to say that this is becoming a problem in the younger children. They are facing the brunt of it, and I will come to it. What, how it actually, uh, uh, how it, it actually the maternal diet, the maternal health, and how the child's early life plays an important role in programming uh, the uh, 
individual to develop these uh, chronic non-communicable diseases. Next one, please. So these are the microbiota. If you look at the human body, we have more microbiota than we have cells. There are so many microbiota and they are supposed to maintain the human health. They maintain the immune system. And in each organ, it is different. And even within an organ, based on the site, specific site is different. But this gets disrupted when there is disease or when there is disruption, disease occurs. So it is like a situation that is like a catch 22 situation that disease causes change as well as a disruption or a dysbiosis leads to disease. The next one, please. So what happens in a depleted microbial diversity? And in, this causes increased chronic inflammation. Now, if you look at the left half of this uh, slide, you can see that this is the generation then, the previous uh, generation earlier on. You would have a vertical transmission of the microbiota. You would have a horizontal transmission of the microbiota. This would uh, lead to a very uh, replete uh, microbial uh, population. There would be a very robust uh, innate immunity, a very robust adaptive immunity. And this results in a very strong and uh, mature immune system and a lack of inflammatory diseases. On the other hand, what we see today is there is a decrease in the vertical transmission, horizontal transmission, there is a depletion of the microbiota. And this leads, this affects the innate immunity, this affects the adaptive immunity, and this then leads to uh, altered uh, uh, maturation of the uh, adaptive Im immunity, and therefore it res results in increased chronic inflammatory diseases and autoimmune diseases. The next slide, please. So uh, can you just uh, uh, press it once more? So when you look at the influences of the microbiome in early life, and this is the C-section, cesarean section. And this is very important because nowadays we know that C-section are sometimes done with indication, but often it is also done very randomly because it's done as a way of choice also. But what does it do? The C-section, cesarean section, significantly alters the abundance of the diverse bacteria in early life. So you can see here the red line versus the blue line. So there is a reduction in the diversity of the uh, microbiota in early life, and this leads to chronic inflammatory diseases. And we have seen that in our data and other data, how it is related with the development of allergies, development of asthma, development of obesity. Next one, please. The same thing you can look at what happens uh, with the antibiotics, I'll come to that. But what happens in the C-section, as I mentioned, the same way there is, of course, there is a um, perinatal uh, inflammation, there is stress, there's altered uh, uh, transient microbial um, colonization, and then this leads to the chronic inflammatory disease. And as you can see here, you can see that it's not only allergic disease, but obesity and cardiovascular disease and so on. They are programmed at this uh, stage of life because of the alteration in the microbiota. Next slide, please. And when you look at the use of the, uh, press it once more, please. When you lo look at the use of antibiotics and the microbial maturation, here again, you can see that the early antibiotic exposure that occurs. Now, the antibiotics are also randomly given uh, in, in to people. You know, you have a viral infection, but you start giving antibiotics, you know, um, even when it's not indicated. So the early antibiotic exposure to children leads to significant delay in the microbial maturation in the first six to 12 months. And this again affects and programs the body to the development of different chronic uh, inflammatory diseases and non-communicable diseases. The next one, please. So what are the other postnasal factors that can uh, lead to the development of, here I talk about allergy and asthma, but it would be the same when we talk about obesity and other chronic inflammatory diseases. So you have, for example, in allergy and asthma, you have early um, inf uh, infections like uh, due to RSV and so on. And then you have the urbanization and the westernized uh, lifestyle. Then you have the antibiotic use, smaller family size with fewer siblings also is a, uh, leads to that. And that's what's happening today. We have fewer siblings and this also programs against this thing, passive smoking, uh, and then the westernized diet, which uh, leads to high fat consumption and then obesity. And of course, the, uh, uh, the uh, indoor and outdoor pollution, again, which aggravates this. 
And then there is, of course, a delayed introduction, which is another aspect. This is really a little bit more specialized, but often people who fear that their children will develop allergies, they resist to introduce the foods in a normal way. And this delayed introduction also uh, leads to the development of certain allergies. Next slide, please. So what is a high fat diet? Now, this is an animal experiment, but this is also shown in, in, in real life uh, that a high dietary fat intake induces a microbiota signature that promotes food allergy as well as obesity. So I'm not going to go into the details, but just trying to say that in this animal model of this uh, of, of experiment, it's shown how the food allergy as well as obesity is actually developed because of the high fat consumption, or when they actually transfer it, the do a transfer the, to germ free uh, mice and then see it, then it's interesting to see that only the food allergy susceptibility remains, but not the obesity. Next slide, please. So what are the diseases associated with an altered microbiome? There are a lot. And some are with a strong association, some are with a weaker association. And you can see here Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, IBD, uh, colorectal cancer, allergy, celiac disease, diabetes, type 1 and type 2, uh, mm -hmm. obesity. And then you have uh, Alzheimer's, atherosclerosis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and cardiovascular disease, and rheumatoid arthritis. So a variety of diseases are affected by an altered microbiome. So the microbiome is probably the most important, um, uh, most important, especially the gut microbiome and the gut microbiome in its relation with the gut brain axis, the gut microbiome along with the lung, uh, the gut and the respiratory, this kind of axis plays an important role in programming the disease as well as in maintaining health. So any disruption of this is very, uh, uh, crucial to prevent that kind of disruption, whether it's through diet, whether it's through lifestyle changes, this is very crucial. And I will come to that as we go on. Next one, please. So when the Lancet Com uh, Commission actually looked at a future of the world's children, uh, WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission actually made some recommendations. What did they say? Despite the dramatic um, uh, movements of survival, nu nutrition, and education over recent years, still today's children have an unprecedented and uncertain future. And if you see countries like India, we are a very young population, you know, very young population, you have more of the younger generation. So we have to actually take care of that. On the other hand, Japan, countries like Japan are uh, almost 65% are above 60 years. And I would say everything that uh, my previous two speakers, Dr. Prasad and Dr. Mala, what they presented are so much relevant to a country like Japan because the aging population is, is really a lot. And as time goes, I'm sure the same thing happens in India as longevity increases. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. When we look at the young population, we need to think of the child and of course, maternal health. At the same time, climate change, ecological degradation, uh, migrating populations, conflict, per, uh, pervasive inequalities, and predatory commercial practices all actually help uh, affect the health and the future of children in various ways in many countries. In 2015, the world's uh, countries agreed on this SDG, and the commission was set with the following recommendations that I will actually come to. Next one. So, they, the uh, recommendations here were made was to invest in children's health uh, for lifelong and intergenerational and economic benefits. And this is very crucial because you need to have early investment in the child's health and education and development. So it's not only the health, but the education and benefits should be available across the, through their life course and through the child's lifetime so that the child's future and the child's health is, and the community's health is maintained. A good health and nutrition is very important. So it's very important to promote nutrition. And this is again, a huge area because often when we look at the kind of diet that uh, people are, children are exposed to, uh, fast food, food with preservatives, and those are, those are, with have more toxins. And therefore th this kind of a high quality and a healthy diet is very, very important. And in, in this, uh, in, in, uh, maintaining the child uh, ch uh, child health. The government's role in uh, 
uh, taking care of this is very, very important because they have to pay, uh, prioritize the protection of child uh, children's health across all. Uh, um, uh, can I have the slide a little bit bigger? It's the size, large, yeah, because it's a little bit difficult. For me to see. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sorry. So the government's role in the care and protection of children is very important across all sectors. So you have to meet the children's health needs. The, the parents should have parental leave. Free primary health care is very important at the point of delivery. Access to healthy and sufficient amounts of food is important because, again, in many countries, especially in the, no, that's too, too big. Sorry. Okay, that's enough. That's it. Um, especially in uh, countries that are uh, resource poor countries, this is very, very important. Well funded or subsidized education, leisure and social activities, and other social protection measures are crucial. The other important thing is to save and healthy environments with clean water, air, and safe spaces to play. Gender parity, that is equal access for education and health for boy, boys and girls. Focusing especially on those in poorer families and marginalized populations, starting by ensuring birth registration so that the government can provide for children across the life course and help them to become engaged and productive adult citizens. So these are some of the recommendations made by this commission. Next slide, please. The other important thing was to measure how children flourish today and also how countries' greenhouse gas emissions are destroying their future. So to address the greenhouse gas emissions that threaten the lives of children, the ecological damage unleashed today and so uh, endangers the uh, future of child's life. So understanding of progress on child health and well-being is very important. And this, again, needs to have da specific data to show that certain interventions have led to an improvement in childhood and child health. And one should give priority to the measures of ecological sustainability and equity to protect all children, including the most vulnerable. The other important thing is to adopt measures to regulate against commercial harm to children. And this is very important because if you look at, as I mentioned, the type of uh, uh, advertisements, the kind of promotions that go, so the children are exposed to unhealthy foods, including fast foods, sugar sweetened beverages, alcohol, tobacco, and all of which are major causes of non-communicable diseases. Again, is the large and growing online exposure because of the uh, internet. Again, they have a lot of advertisement that comes through, and therefore they are exposed to all these things. So some kind of regulation in this uh, against commercial harm is has also been recommended, uh, recommended by this uh, WHO UNICEF Lancet Commission. Next one, please. So childhood is the ideal time to intervene. Childhood is a special time for vulnerability and also an opportunity. So interventions during pregnancy. So pregnant women and children are again, and girls are most vulnerable to biological and social risks that increase the susceptibility to disease, disability, and preventable mortality. As I mentioned earlier, maternal diet itself is very important because now what we know is the microbiosis does not only happen after birth, it happens in the mother's womb. So her exposure to antibiotics, her exposure to environment pollutants, her exposure to um, uh, uh, unhealthy products, and her exposure to an unbalanced diet all play an important role in the development of disease also in the children. And the care and nutrition for mothers are therefore very important before and during the pregnancy and also in the child's healthy growth and development throughout their life course. And of course, after birth, breastfeeding of the newborn, again, is very important. So again, that period of life is very important to protect both the mother and child uh, in from a health regulatory point of view. Next slide, please. When we look at the future of the world's children, and who uh, WHO, the same commission, looked at uh, uh, the benefit-cost ratio or return on every U.S. dollar invested. So they looked at the return to investment in a children's health and well-being across a variety of domains. So this figure shows the high returns to investment in children's health 
and well-being across a variety of domains. So you can see some of I, I'm, uh, this uh, for, uh, uh, writing is very small. I'm sorry, it's a very busy slide, but you can see here adolescent health, investing in adolescent health, investing in child health, investing in, can you enlarge it a bit, uh, please? Sorry, I wish I could have done it myself. Um, oh, that's too late. Uh, sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, figure. I want to figure. Photo. Figure the kind of, yeah. Uh, figure the kind of, this one make this come to the okay, yeah yeah that's okay that bring it down a little bit yeah okay so a little bit down okay so you can uh, so uh, adolescent health adolescent uh, uh, child how how you can pr uh, prevent adolescent child ma all these different um, uh, factors when we actually target that health in low and middle income countries maternal and child health maternal and, um, and uh, child health in low income countries then basic sanitation drinking water when all these different parameters you invest money in that they have all shown to have an ro uh, return of investment much more so anything that is greater than one because this is actually the calculation is how much you spend and how much benefit you get so anything that's greater than one is a positive indication so you can see here all these have a scale that is greater than one which indicates that investing in these different aspects are very crucial for a better maternal as well as child health. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Sorry. And when you look at the sustainable development goals measuring protective and risk factors for child well being across the life course, you have to look at the protective factors and the vulnerability factors. When you look at the protective factors, again, can you enlarge it a little bit? I'm sorry about this. For, yeah. So, for example, for the protective factors, you have responsive care, you have skilled birth attended, social and uh, um, group support, birth registration, immunization, support for early child development, school achievement, parity in education, safe learning environments, ICT literacy, and of course, universal access to uh, SRH. So these different, all these different factors actually are protective for the child. And the other factors, can you just raise, bring it up a little bit so I can see the lower part? Okay, yeah, that's okay. The other aspects which are actually um, um, damaging or uh, causes vulnerability in the health are maternal deprivation, neonatal risks like low birth weight, which is very important. Low birth weight, we have also shown that prematurity and low birth weight causes a uh, dysbiosis in the microbiota also. And that also leads to neonatal uh, sepsis. It leads to so infections. It leads to also chronic uh, non-communicable diseases. And then malnutrition and poor uh, growth, child labor, commercial exploitation, child marriage, adolescent birth. So all these different factors have been shown and exposure to physical, sexual and uh, psychological violence, as well as the use of uh, tobacco. And so that comes in the commercial exploitation. And these different factors actually have a negative effect on the uh, child health. Next slide, please. So a future for the world's children requires, you need to have community participatory learning and action. Women's groups has shown to reduce newborn mortality. And we know now as actually Dr. Mala just referred to the fact about India's uh, uh, life expectancy being um, lower than uh, very low compared to many other countries. Similarly, the infant mortality in India is much higher than many other countries. And therefore, again, the community participatory learning and action are very, uh, very important to reduce that infant mortality. Again, community level interventions on child nutritional status uh, and on determinants therefore, like water, sanitation, and hygiene. And here I can say it was very important role for Ayurveda to come in because I, the the combination or the integration of Ayurveda with uh, allopathic medic uh, medication in a holistic approach, in an integrated approach, looking at not just about treatment of disease, but about prevention. Because 
medicine should be about prevention and medicine should be about wellness and not just about treatment. Treatment is important but when a disease starts, but we want to try to prevent disease and we want to try to increase wellness. Again, local resources are very important. Delivering integrated activities to improve and community health workers play an important role in education and in giving the information and also in following up the health uh, situation in rural areas. Next slide, please. Again, safeguarding the health and well-being of children is very important. Governments are uh, uh, have to have the shared responsibility of these matters, but it also involves uh, not only governments, but international bodies, civil societies, academia, and of course, uh, healthcare professionals are all equally responsible. So there has to be an integrated approach uh, in this uh, particular aspect. Specific governance arrangements also have to be done in, in this at both national and subnational levels. Next slide, please. So what are the targeted recommendations that have come out of that ensure access to healthcare? Society must ensure that women, their partners and children have access to high quality, comprehensive health services across the life course and care should be patient and family centered and emphasize preventative services as I just mentioned. Well-established healthcare delivery system is very important. So innovative multidisciplinary model of a team care enhanced use of technology, whether it's telemedicine or it's mobile uh, health, all these factors that engage the patient and allows more interaction between the uh, doctor and the patient are very, very important. And proactively monitor health and disease and preventative holistic integrated care is uh, to be targeted at wellness. Address social and environmental factors, as I already mentioned, that we have to look at the environment and improve the environmental situation through climate uh, mitigation and health adaptation. And also it requires systematic coordinated efforts across several sectors, including health, education, social justice, clean water, air, and sanitation. And of course, assessment of health services and data. We need to understand the disease burden. This has to be monitored on a regular basis to understand what is the disease burden in the country? What is the, how, how are our interventions actually improving? Does the uh, um, uh, concept of having uh, integrated care improve the health uh, situation? These are very, very important. For everything, evidence-based data is absolutely crucial. As Dr. Mala already mentioned, when we come to Ayurveda also, the thing that is absolutely essential that every uh, treatment, every therapy should be subject to scientific uh, analysis and evidence-based data is the strongest way of how we can go forward with promoting uh, an integrated health of Ayurveda into the system that we already have and try to bring the concept of um, not only anti-aging, but the concept of wellness from the uh, uh, birth of a child, from the uh, womb of a mother, uh, through the entire life course of the individual. Next slide, please. So the global strategy also uh, was done in the U.S. because interestingly, the U.S. realized that their infant mortality is very high because of disparities in uh, racial disparities and so on. And this they realized even more uh, uh, during the COVID time. So they have also come up with certain recommendation that all uh, um, women and children and adolescents must be at the heart of sustainable SDG and a world in every, which every mother can enjoy a wanted healthy pregnancy and childbirth. Every child can survive beyond on their fifth uh, birthday and every woman, child and adolescent can thrive to realize their full potential is absolutely essential. And this uh, involves good nutrition, established routines, activity, family stability, participation in community activities, because this will then takes care of not only the physical health, but also the mental health. Next slide, please. Uh, can we go to the next slide? I'm just, I think I'm running out of time. Yeah. So the important thing is we have to survive, uh, thrive, and end preventable deaths by reducing global maternal mortality, by reducing newborn mortality, by reducing under five mortality, by ending epidemics of communicable as well as non-communicable diseases. And then we have to thrive by end all forms of malnutrition and address the nutritional needs of children, adolescent girls, and pregnant and lactating women. Ensure universal access to uh, sexual and reproductive health care. Ensure that all girls and boys have access to good quality early childhood development, sustainability, uh, reduce uh, pollution uh, related deaths and illnesses. 
achieve universal health coverage, which is absolutely essential because that is something that we really lack. And that is what Ted Rose from the World Health Organization has really been pushing for financial risk protection and access to quality essential services, medicines and vaccines. Next slide, please. So, and then we transform the expanding uh, enabling environment. So we eradicate extreme poverty, ensure all girls and boys com have complete free, equitable, good quality primary, secondary education, uh, because this is very important also for mental health, eliminate all harmful practices, achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking, enhance scientific research, upgrade technological capabilities, and encourage innovation. Provide legal identity for all, including birth registration, enhance uh, the global partnership for sustainable development. These are the recommendations of the global stra uh, strategy that actually was put forward by the United States uh, as a result of what they realized during the COVID time affecting ch um, maternal and child health. Next slide, please. And there are protective factors, as I've already covered this. I'm not going to repeat this. Next slide, please. So when we look at the maternal and child health in Singapore, we realize here that it's an issue is not, they, they are in a different, it's an issue is not about infant mortality. That's not, but it's about maternal obesity, mental disorders during the pregnancy, childhood obesity, behavioral disorders, and later life metabolic disease, catalyzing vicious cycles of disease. So this is very important. So we have to see that we have to keep a balance in a country like India, for example, and when we go to the G20 countries again, there are many such situations where we have di difference in the um, uh, economic situation of the country. And therefore, we either see uh, at one end of the paradigm, we see that they have a lot of infant mortality. On the other end of the par paradigm, we see there are a lot of uh, non-communicable diseases. So both these have to be considered and therefore an integrated approach that targets both uh, um, the uh, ends of this paradigm need to be actually looked uh, after. So this new model of care is designed to secure a population with healthy life cycles by influencing each life course early in life to pr provide the best start for generations to come. Next slide, please. And when we talk about Ayurveda for childhood, healthy foods, I, I shouldn't be speaking about this because we have an August audience who are so much knowledgeable of this and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still learning about it. So I just want to say what I would say is I, healthy foods, enough sleep and adequate exercise are crucial from an allopathic point of view also when we talk about wellness. But Ayurveda is a science of life contributes significantly in improving maternal and uh, newborn's health, as well as in reducing disease and disabilities. The holistic regimen advising uh, during various stages of pregnancy and childbirth comprising of thoughts, action, dietary modification and herbs aim to ensure a healthy and smooth childbirth at the same time, sustain the overall health, nutrition and well-being of uh, the women and the baby. And therefore, the branch of Ayurveda that takes care of child health, uh, Kamara uh, Brithya, that deals with feeding and nutrition of ch children, care and cure of the one who feeds the baby, correction of feeding problems and the disease occurring in them. So care measures and preparations are well before the child is born and the concept continues throughout the developing ages of a child. So what I would like to end with by saying is that it is very important to integrate the uh, uh, science of Ayurveda into in, in a um, in an evidence based format within the uh, uh, paradigm of the uh, treatment that we do today. Ayurveda is like personalized medicine. When we talk about personalized medicine in allopathy, we could say that Ayurveda is a prototype of personalized medicine, which actually is very individualized. And therefore, uh, looking at Ayurveda as an important arm for wellness, for uh, child health and maternal health is absolutely crucial and the way forward for integrating it along with Western medicine. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Professor Ruby Pawankar. Actually, in our earlier schedule, we had a three-day program of this seminar, and her presentation was scheduled on the third day, 17th. I sent the program to her, but she was traveling, and just as she was on the end of her travel, in, the, in her flight, she was going to board the flight, and she called me and asked me, when is my presentation? I said, it is today itself. So she didn't have time to rest or relax, 
but she kept her word to me and i'm thankful to you because you have so much of exposure and experience in this field i think these are the challenges that all the doctors be it allopathic or ayurvedic they are facing but especially because this is a forum for ayurvedic doctors and this morning dr pratap chauhan pointed out towards the garbha sanskar and masanumasik and answarna prashana all these things the, he is taking care of the ayurvedic doctors are dealing with all these but you have brought to our focus the mother and child health and the challenges that we have thank you so much and i don't think there are many questions or there is any time because we still have three presentations sorry so i would yeah so i would request you to kindly send your paper as and when it is possible because this will be a part of our proceedings when we publish them and i am personally thankful to you for accepting my request and joining in for this conference this will lend emphasis and force to the recommendations that we are going to make for this g20 presidency where ayurveda should be ayurveda or for that matter integrated medicine should be a part of the policy draft thank you so much thanks again thank you very much i i, I wish i could have <laughs> had some more slides on ayurveda <laughs> yeah thank you i think i i would just like to say one thing before i i yeah, think please, in ayurveda please. one of the one of the things would be very nice i mean i i just heard two talks but i i would have loved to hear but i can read the chapters uh, one of the things that would be very nice to see is how ayurvedic uh, medication and or the anti aging is actually affecting the microbiome because is it changing the microbiome what is it doing i think this is a huge area of research and when dr mala was talking about the the need for having a research and is uh, and scientific uh, a uh, collaboration this i think is absolutely needed we should have a whole, whole center where actually there's a huge uh, uh, research done in that space and i think it's important to look at how it's changing the microbiome and if we can show that we can prove to the rest of the world how great this um, uh, uh, form of medicine is and how it, and that is the way it will be more accept, uh, acceptable in many countries thank you thank you thank you dr bhavna she is she was a presenter she is working now presently on the microbiome as well dr bhavna prashant yes yes she is oh, working yeah, yes, she... working yes, yes. Uh, i would love to uh, you know uh, be in touch with her sorry i missed all the talks because i was on the flight and yesterday i was in a conference so i'm so sorry yeah please yes, i, I would love to be in touch with her yes yes thank you okay. thanks dr prasad for bringing in that information because dr bhavna prashar she is a senior scientist at csir and she presented her paper yesterday so she is working on this and collecting all this data with validation for validation on a scientific scale thank you so we now come to the next session and that is next paper in the same session women and child health we have dr sarika chaturvedi she is also a senior scientist at dr d y patil vidyapeet pune maharashtra her topic is reimagining women's health in g20 the potential of traditional medicine i will introduce dr sarika sarika's work over two decades spans public health and health system research focusing on maternal health her work on maternal health in india includes demand and supply side issues public private partnerships and quality of care she has an international collaborative research experience and has also worked with civil society organizations in india she has been an evaluator for health and development programs by the government of india and un agencies she has lived in rural maharashtra while working with community health programs and was involved in health human resource development she is experienced in using quantitative and qualitative research methods she graduated in ayurvedic medicine has a masters in health system management she trained at the karolinska institute sweden for her doctoral education in public health her interest areas are integrative health quality of care quality and care women's and children's health traditional health practices and public health policy 
Sarika is currently a scientist at Dr. D. Y. Patil University, Pune, exploring Ayurveda based traditional practices for their preventive and promotive potential. She has been a member of the working group of Niti Ayog for Integrative Health System in India and has been a member coordinator of the Indian National Medical Sciences Task Force on Evidence-Based Traditional Medicine for Healthcare in India. The report of the task force was recently released with the endorsement by the Indian Ministry for Health and Family Wear. Family Welfare. Sarika currently works as a Commission Fellow for the Lancet Citizens Commission for Reimagining India's Health System. She is involved as a core team member of the G20 subgroup on holistic health. Dr. Sarika Chaturvedi, now you, you are invited to present your paper on women's health. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you organizers for this opportunity. Um, I think I should thank Dr. Ram Manohar. It's his greatness that he called me for this uh, talk because all the experts have been very, very senior people and I'm just a beginner in this field. And so I, what I would do in the allotted time is just uh, do not go too much into details, but talk on the broader areas. As I was told, this meeting is more about looking at what we could um, tell the T20 as we have the presidency this year. So I would be, um, I would try to be brief and uh, build on what has been said before, like uh, in Dr. Ramadesh Sundar's presentation yesterday, we learned about the theory and all the audience here are well versed with it. You know, Dr. Ram Munar today um, built very well on the mind body aspects. And so I would go a little further than that and uh, make my points on the potential of the system. Gladly, women's health is something that is very much central to the global development agenda. Investing in women's and children's health is known to be a very cost-effective strategy, as it will be powerful also to share with us. So we know that this leads to economic progress and healthier and stronger societies. So we are already on a good start that women's health is very well recognized as an important area of interest globally. I would point to what has been so far the focus of policies and what strategies have been used. Generally, uh, what is picked up for attention is providing antenatal care, providing services for childbirth, providing family planning services, and nutrition, and more of the nutrition in children has been the focus. Uh, we have several targets uh, in of maternal childhood that mirror the global indicators, such as those of the MDGs before and the SDGs now. We have several programs in different countries that focus on maternal and childhood MCH that I've used here. So selected targets and progress indicators. What has been uh, said in the target or what have been the progress indicators of what drive the local strategies. So the point I want to make here is if some strategies have to be made, we know where, where the right start is to be made. So the examples of current measures that I use are how many women receive uh, skilled birth attendance. There's a specific definition of what a skilled attendant is, but they are uh, trained in obstetrics, obstetrician providers or trained in obstetrics personnel. So nothing to do with traditional medicine here. Number of women who receive complete antenatal care or number of newborns who receive supposed uh, visits at home visits in India, suppose or other parts where children newborn are visited by trained people. So these are what is measured and what is Hence, important to people who execute programs. We, however, do not know how many women who seek traditional uh, care during pregnancy. There is no data, and nobody is hardly bothered to look at that. We do not know how many women who follow uh, traditional medicine-based postpartum care practices. Suppose we do not know how many infants receive traditional newborn care, because these are some things that do not come to the system, but that. Uh, people use and people very popularly use in a variety of ways. So you know, now there's uh, in the recent decade, people have been trying to study the use of complementary medicine. Suppose this a literature we show about one to eighty-seven percent women. In this review said um, they use some form of complementary medicine for in during their pregnancy. People have been trying to understand what are the motivations. If this is not 
coming through the system, still people are trying to seek alternative care. So what are the motivations? Where do people seek information from? And what, what do they perceive the need for this? Similarly, uh, I mean myself uh, with the guidance of my mentor, Professor Patwatan, we looked at uh, infant massage practices in two states of India. And we found it was about 90% people use massage in a variety of ways. And later on, we found that people said they didn't know, nobody told them to do it or not to do it. And providers were not even bothered or even aware of it. There's a lot of evidence around it, but it is not something that comes into discussion at the consultations or at, as routine. So we went on to develop a guideline uh, on that, but I think there's some more work that is needed. So uh, coming back to the traditional medicine and women's health area, um, the point I want to make is that these are living traditions that women follow linked to traditional medicine, and uh, they are intertwined very much into the local culture, though we do not come to the system. So they are not accounted for in any target. There are no indicators of progress on these lines. So this points to there's a great disconnect between what is measured and what people use or what is preferred by women and communities. And this, uh, to say, uh, not to go to the long story, but this is a result of the neglect of traditional medicine in the overall global agenda setting. Traditional medicine has been on the back seat, and uh, we know for various reasons, and this is also reflected in the area of women's and children's health. So, uh, over the next few minutes, I would like us to put our mind to think, can policies for women and childhood be inclusive of traditional medicine? That is what Dr. Shashi Prabha, RIS, VI, and all the organizers want us to uh, bring about. I would like to, us to think why, and then I would learn on how this could be possible, if we are convinced uh, that is required. So in the uh, next few minutes, I will try trying to bring out the potential, and then I would say what I would think could be done towards this, and I would invite suggestions from the experts, um, speakers, and also in the audience. So uh, before saying on to the potential, I would like to us to be reminded of where we stand, what is the status quo of issues that we need to address when we think of traditional medicine use, so we now have, uh, like Dr. Ruby Pawankar would very well appreciate, that over the last, until last few decades, young women marrying at a young age, conceiving early, having too many children were the issues that the UN agencies, WHO, and countries like India were um, focusing on. Now we have the other side. The increasing age of marriage is the issue. The average age of conception when women conceive the first child is rising. We have, we planning fertility for various reasons, other than health, maybe environmental, maybe climate change, and so many other reasons. But we do see a great mushrooming of you know, clinics that provide artificial um, conceptual services, the ART clinics, they're called. We see the related complications. We see a lot of mental health issues in women, and even men undergoing such kind of treatments. And of course, these are highly expensive measures. We also see increased complications of pregnancy. <laughs> We see there are more what's medically defined as high risk pregnancies and precious pregnancies. In every pregnancy is precious, but what we call medically as very precious pregnancies conceived with very great difficulty, that kind of pregnancies are on the rise. We have rising women who are who are high risk factors for non-communicable diseases than ever before, both in urban and rural areas and across countries. Maybe this is true for all G20 countries, I suppose. We are also seeing a very big epidemic of polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, PCOS it is called. This is not yet understood, but I think this is a, there, there is a divide on how and what PCOS is caused about, but I think to my algorithmic understanding, this is a effect of what lifestyle we are into and what environment we are living in. So there's a lot of scope for traditional medicine to look at that. So we have challenges that have been persistent. Women have some women have problems with access to treatment, a major portion of society may be in some area, but there are newer challenges that have been coming up. Interestingly, some of these and many of uh, the risk factors that are known, they're not treatable by contemporary medicine approach. This is now well accepted that there is no thing. And sometimes we are, we have to ask this question, that are the situations, are the challenges that we see are inevitable from the current lifestyle that we have, 
or some prevention possible. And then there comes the scope of traditional medicine, or especially Ayurveda. Now, I, I bring this interesting paper here, which talks about very recent paper in the BMC endocrine disorders, which talks about uh, PCOS and seeing beyond diet and physical activity. And what I would want to point out, these authors say that um, all involving PCOS treatment need to be aware of traditional medicine use uh, because patients are using it on a very large scale and which is not coming into picture anywhere when modern treatment is considered. But this is a choice patient by, driven by patients themselves. So the persistent challenge we made there, lost sections of our society which have issues with access to care, costs of care. And one important part that comes to women's and child session is that is the care culturally competent? We have a lot of uh, issues with cultural incompetence of the care being provided. What I mean is that this is in that it is debated whether women do like to go to institutions for deliveries. Do they receive the kind of care that they are culturally used to? Is it or something that gives them disrespect, abuse, and something that looks down upon the culture of women and the local traditions? So this is an important area. We also have newer times where we have rising incidence of substance abuse in women, addictions in women, which we never saw before, rising tremendously in all countries, including in India. We also see women who have now, there's a great struggle between their professional and personal roles, um, goals. I come to how this affects their health, but this is something that is a, this is a context that we should not forget when we are dealing with women's health. Rising stress among women as among men, but it affects women very much differently, that I should say. We have a context where the family structure is no longer as used to be. Before, we have shrinking families, not only shrinking families, but single people most of the time in the family. Then the social support that was uh, very much popular in India and other Asian countries, that structure is breaking almost, and also related to issues in geriatric care. So we have a very great imbalance and in health that is popped up among women and hence there's a call for a balanced approach and a better way of life. And I think Ayurveda, the science of life, comes in here with a very strong potential. So the holistic approach of Ayurveda or traditional medicine is not about uh, treating her reproductive system, but treating the woman and her environment. So it includes all aspects mentioned before, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, and seeing her as a part of the entire spectrum and not as an individual reproductive system that is being treated. It's also important to note that the physiology in the female body is very sensitive to non-physical aspects. It's not just about the body, but other elements, like Dr. Ramana today talked about the PNER axis, psychoneuroendocrinological axis, very important for the uh, well functioning of the female uh, physiology. So women's health is in the traditional medicine concept, it's about balance and harmony. Women's and children's health is more about nurturing. It's not about just delivering a baby or a uterus pushing out a baby. It's more about nurturing a life and creating a balanced life. So uh, the health of the child is a continuum of the woman's health and inseparable from the health of the mother. We also have a changed context in which we are talking about traditional medicine in the modern society, where the women's role has changed. We do not have uh, what we used to be seeing as women as the pillars of the family, or sometimes the first physicians. We properly talked about the dadi maka batwa, or there's no dadi in the family now, and there's no batwa. So we, have, we are in a very newer context or so-called modern societies. That has affected on the family nutrition. The woman used to be the one who used to decide uh, the diet, take care of healthy behaviors in the family and practices and lifestyle that nurturing happened within the family. So that strong pillar is uh, somehow um, too modernized today, I would say. So declining time for art, creativity, creativity and socialization in the modern world is something that uh, traditional medicine practitioner would say these are the special strengths and needs of the feminine women. Well, naturally, we have seen women to be so creative than the men. That's the difference that they are born with. So do, nowadays, when we have equate uh, uh, the time the race, we do not value these aspects of the feminine. 
question I have to myself and to the audience here, are we going in a very accelerated mode? Is this uncontrolled and hence affecting the overall health and, other, and the context for women's and children's health? I think the race uh, is too fast and has taken away the grace. Not something that just is a medical issue per se, but it is the context that we are talking in about the potential for traditional medicine. So I would say uh, when the Europe says it's slow down Europe, I think that that has a greater meaning to women's health all over. Coming to some of the medicalization points, there's now an overstress on planning. What used to be ha happen as a natural uh, act uh, in people's homes, ha it happens in the ERP centers now, very medicalized pregnancies. Anemia in women in the reproductive age still is a challenge in many parts of the world, including half of our women in India and I would suppose. So there, there's no lack of treatment. We have very well proven evidence-based interventions, but some the failure makes us think, oh, why is it so? Can we explore traditional medicine for such an important issue here? Episiotomy is now known that it is a harmful practice, no need in every case, but it continues to be very rampantly used where, where we promote institutional births to that extent. Uh, overuse of stimulants, for, um, overuse stimulants for in the productive cycles and also for stimulations for, during labor. Overuse of analgesics, oxytocin hormone to speed up the birth. These all have been leading to an increase in asphyxia in the newborn's mortality and mobility. These are uh, issues we have to deal with when we talk of medicalized world. So there are sections, Dr. Ruby Gonkar very profoundly explained the uh, uh, impacts of high cesarean rates when they're not required. And let me tell you, where in these, where we look at especially the urbanized, educated, well-off communities, these rates are as high as 80 or 90 percent, even in the poorer parts of the world. Postpartum anxiety, depression, fatigue, all mental health issues related to childbirth are on the rise and have been increasingly reported. We never saw so much of postpartum depression or fatigue in uh, uh, settings like India. Coming to childhood development issues, we are seeing development issues, uh, especially social and emotional development. And next explore though, but these are observations of people, development pediatricians, and these are, we know, are closely linked to how uh, upbringing happens and early life events. Nutrition in infancy, maternal nutrition, the quality of breast milk available, weaning practices, which used to be very traditional, very seasonal, very much accustomed to the age of the child are now going into packets. So we do not have any more uh, traditional medicine or traditional understanding there. The first diet in life is very, very important and how the developing microbiome is very much affected by the diet in early life. And now we all have it into packets. So that is the context that we are talking about childhood development. And this has a lot of impact on adult health. The exposure of adolescent and adult mental health issues probably linked to everything being outsourced. The oxytocin system develops in the first two years of life, very much in the first year of life, when the maternal touch, when the caring, when the nursing is very important. But now in the race, we do not see that happen. It's just, uh, we have suppose uh, some parts of the world where the leave is just six weeks, and even less than six weeks. So where's the time for the mother to actually do what helps? We know that that is what Nurturing and nursing is important for the bonding, for the mental health, and it has implications to adult and adolescent mental health. So the social support are important and varied. Like I live in Sweden where the maternity leave is two years. The father gets a three-month leave and the mother gets the rest of the leave and you could nurture your baby in the best way you could think possible. But on the other extreme, that is not a reality in the majority of the world. We do not have enough child support services for the woman to be at peace when she is at work. So these are issues that need to be understood and you know, dealt with when we talk of traditional medicine. So what we could have looked at what Ayurveda provides, I would go not go into very much detail, but this we call Garbhini Paricharya, Masalu Masik that people have talked about, with emphasis on the diet and the lifestyle of the pregnant woman and also considering the emotional and spiritual aspects during pregnancy, uh, affecting the fetus as well. There's a lot of literature coming up about how the unborn fetus picks up every action, every 
part of the diet, every thought, every emotion of the mother affects the unborn fetus and hence it continues when the child is born. So these are important aspects less studied, beginning to be studied, but very important contributions that traditional medicine can make. Similarly about postpartum care, there's a paper from uh, Goa which uh, said that women who did not have access to the social support, the traditional practices that we follow during the six weeks after childbirth, inclusive of diet, massage, and what um, other social support measures are provided to the mother. When women do not have this, they were linked to women having postpartum depression and fatigue. So these are very important contributions that Ayurveda can make to the regimes that can provide for maternal home child health. You must also remember that if women's health is beyond reproductive health. We see a rise in number of women with breast cancer, cervical cancer, and we are all linked to other issues, not necessarily medical, but environmental and other factors. The health of older women also remains a neglected area. Now, Tomala would agree with me, the Health Page report is very frightening to talk about elderly abuse among women is rising so high in India, even among the educated women. So these are aspects that need to be considered very well that need a lot of thought on the spiritual aspects as well. So the key message from the first part that I would make is women's and children's health and well-being is not merely a medical issue. We require addressing challenges that require an intersectoral approach and much coordination between different um, sectors, policies in education, employment, the work environment for women need a TM or a traditional medicine orientation and alignment with the holistic approach. Health policies need to be inclusive of traditional medicine and care for women and children needs to be culturally competent. So the potential for inclusions we have are health regimes during pregnancy, postpartum care, infancy. We have a lot to learn from yoga and meditation, focused interventions for peace, balance and harmony in women's life. Social measures to support women's special roles, their roles as mothers, as the strengths of the family, work policies need to be conducive to those, work environments need to be supportive. Traditional medicine approach in service delivery is, is important. Orientation of providers to be culturally competent is an important area to be looked at when we are promoting institutional goals, institutional care for every aspect. So over to the second part, I could talk about how traditional medicine approach uh, could be included in the overall global agenda, and specifically in the G20 countries. So I would enlist a few strategies uh, I could think of, and I would suggest some action agendas that we are looking forward to. So I, I have made four strategies involving traditional medicine experts in the design of global and national policies for women's and children's health including the traditional medicine specific indicators in the measure of progress. What gets measured is what drives policies and local actions, hence that recommendation. Support the provision of traditional medicine-based care in the national delivery system. In Japan, it could be different. In India, it could be different. So as a traditional medicine-based, that could be I believe India. Prioritize and support research on traditional medicine interventions mm -hmm. to address the person's challenges to women's and children's health. The four broad strategies I could think of and there could be related action agendas. Importantly, being evolved a holistic health framework for women's and children's health, addressing the spectrum of issues affecting health. So we look at women's health in a holistic manner and have a framework for that. Include perspectives of women and community members in developing this framework and local programs. I think there's a lot of wisdom there in the women and in the community members who could help us with this. Engage with experts to identify areas where complementary, uh, where the current programs could be benefited. Uh, synthesize the knowledge on prevalent practices in traditional medicine practices for women and use that data. Importantly, the data should be used to inform appropriate actions in different countries. Develop the programs to develop uh, and orient healthcare providers to be culturally competent. So be very um, practical. Uh, very pragmatic, we could have systematically identified the research priorities to address the knowledge gaps in traditional medicine interventions with potential for immediate uptake. Commission rigorous research, we could recommend commissioning rigorous research on above identified priorities. Some of it is very common knowledge, observations and documentations have not been made though. So that kind of research is required. 
We need to set models for utilization of the research findings, ensure the uptake of findings in the development of guidelines for clinical and public health practice in different levels and support and monitor the use of about practice guidelines. I think I see that this is the way we could actually deliver with a traditional medicine approach for women's and children's health. So thank you, thank you very much. And I would be happy to take more suggestions and ideas to develop the action agenda. Thanks a lot. Namaste. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarika Chaturvedi. You have brought in a very vast canvas and the key term in your presentation, if I may say, is the cultural competence. It's very important when you say that even the child care is not culturally competent. So I think with that key term to be a message for the caregivers and social members and family members as well, you have given potential inclusions, key messages and global context for G20 action agenda has also been given by you. Thank you so much. Now your paper is open for questions. We have 10 minutes for questions, please. If nobody to ask, we can go ahead. Yeah. Or I can make some, uh, some comments out of little bit out of this if we have 10 minutes no we don't have then okay, we then we'll still go. have two more presentations so, you, no. so i think with the help of slides you have made your presentation so simple yes. nobody has any questions and no disagreement is there because you have presented a picture of our society in current times which is very realistic so there is no doubt about that I think we now go ahead to the next session then, if there are no questions, shall we? Sure. Next session is the last session of this two days national conference. And this is about well-being of herbal and animal world, Vrikshayurveda and Ashwayurveda. These two aspects were left in the original scheme of things. And when I asked Dr. Ram Manohar, is there anybody who can speak on these from the Ayurveda field he knows? He said he doesn't remember anybody. Then I requested one of my friends whether she could write on Briksha Ayurveda. There is a chapter in Brihat Sangita and there is another book on Briksha Ayurveda. And she agreed, although she is not an Ayurveda specialist, but she is a Sanskrit scholar. And her surname is, of course, Vaidya. So maybe she has a connection, some ancestral connection. She is Dr. Professor Uma C. Vaidya. And her topic will be well-being of the herbal world in the Vrikshayurveda. She is the former vice chancellor of Kavikul Guru Kalidas Sanskrit University, Nagpur. She has worked as R.G. Bhandarkar, professor of Sanskrit, head department of Sanskrit at Mumbai University. Currently, she is the Infosys Scholar at Bhandarkar Oriental Institute, Pune, and also the member of Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla Academic Committee. She is member of many prestigious institutions, and she has received several awards, including the latest one which she received only yesterday. She was planning to come to Shimla, but nobody could make it actually, not only she. She has authored some books, and these books include optionals in Sanskrit language and Panini. She has specialized in grammar. Then Abhijata Sanskrit Sahityacha Itihasa in Marathi, Vishwa Karma in Hindi and English, then Yoga Vasishta and Anipanthiya Tattva Jnana in Marathi. She has been very active. She has been a member of the UGC former member of the Maharshi Sandipani Vedavidya Pratishthan Ujjain, former member of the Board of Management Deccan College Pune, and former member of the Committee for Sanskrit Project Deccan College Pune. May I invite Professor Uma Vaidya for her presentation now on the topic well-being of herbal, this is well-being of the herbal world in the Vrikshayurveda. Uma ji, has she joined? Yeah, Thank please. you very much for uh, the introduction that you have given. 
is everybody listening me hearing me properly yeah yeah we can okay we under can. the theme ayurveda the holistic science for the well-being of the world the topic of my paper is the well-being of the herbal world in the vriksha ayurveda with the permission of the chairperson and thanks to her i will now proceed with my topic the term vriksha ayurveda can be viewed at two different levels the first one is the macro level to explain the word as denoting the science of plant life in general and the second one is the micro level to explain the contents of the text of ruksha ayurveda in particular the thought on these two levels can give justice to the topic as these two levels are mutually consistent complementary interrelated and sometimes overlapping too generally people think of the well being of human beings through the herbal world but this title expects something different than the usual practice with this brief introduction i will enter into the first part of my paper which will discuss the word vriksha ayurveda as the title of a separate and special science on plant life all of us are familiar with the word ayurveda as the science of well being of humans explaining their health diseases and remedies this science has important texts like charaka samhita sushruta samhita vakbhata samhita etc this is the manusha ayurveda there are other two texts entitled ashva ayurveda and hastya ayurveda taking care of the health of horses and elephants this is pranya ayurveda and in the same series of ayurveda texts we have ruksha ayurveda dealing with the well being of the herbal world the science deals with all the aspects of plant life in 360 degrees such as seeds for planting plantation watering manuring flowering and fruition grafting for changing the colors of flowers or taste of fruits etc and also the diseases of plants and their remedies all these three branches mentioned above that is manusha ayurveda pranya ayurveda and vriksha ayurveda indicate the noble thought deep rooted in indian culture expressed Last in just two words as vasudhaiva kutumbakam and also suggest that our happiness depends on the happiness of our surroundings it may be animals plants or weather that is the environment in general now let us think about the historicity of the science of ruksha ayurveda as the modern research methodology insist on the point of historicity one gets the first concrete literary reference in the rigveda in the aksha sukta that is the dice hymn and the words are krushimit krushasva this first reference suggests that even before the rigveda the entire process from cultivating the land to getting the fully developed crop was in practice there are two more suktas in rigveda which are the pieces of evidence to confirm that rigvedic people knew to produce abundant crops however i am aware that today's topic is not agriculture in general but the plant life in particular still one must know about the plants and crops too because both of them have their origin as soil products and both are mutually connected even in the yajurveda one finds a direct reference to the trees and herbs praying for the peace in them as vanaspataya shantihi and oshadhaya shantihi here the word shanti refers to the balanced state of trees and herbs with their juicy medicinal nature and abundance in produce and suggests that they should remain in conformity with their natural properties and prove to be useful for mankind in the atharva veda 
one finds krushi nishpatti karma as a title to a section but the sixth kind of atharva veda goes a step further and mentions not only the crops but also the trees like shami and palasha under the vruksha category with their beneficial properties curiously the atharva veda informs about 300 plants used as medicines much more information about them can be gathered from the article of mrudu smita devi from all these vedic references it is evident that the vedic people were knowers and practitioners of various types of crops trees and plants and methods of their plantation too this leads to the point that the seeds of the science of agriculture and plant life are seen in the vedas it is interesting to note that the sanskrit word vruksha is derived from two different roots one is from the root bruha which means to grow and the second one is the root vrascha which means to cut thus vruksha means that which grows fast and thus requires cutting or requires cutting to grow fast however in the fourfold or fivefold classification of trees in various scientific treatises vruksha is that which bears flowers and fruits the amar kosha classifies the trees under bhumi varga and vanaushadhi varga the charaka sushruta samhitas limit the word vanaspati to the trees that bear fruits but no evident flowers in the rugveda vanaspati literally meaning the lord of forest is a deity presiding over the forest there are different types of classes of trees recorded in different treatises coming under the science of plant life such as herbs shrubs trees creepers climbers bushes etc a detailed description of all these classes can be obtained from various websites with the time passage and with the progress in the process of cultivation these two branches of studies that is agriculture and science of plant life were separated the text like krushi parashara or parashara samhita were written focusing on agriculture science and the text like vruksha ayurveda and upavina vinoda upavana vinoda were specially written for the herbal world the upavana vinoda which forms but a small chapter of sharang dharaj encyclopedic work is an interesting sanskrit treatise on arboreal horticulture this treatise represents only a branch of a much larger science this suggests that one must look out for other branches of larger body of knowledge comprehended under vruksha ayurveda it is not however to claim that this science reached its fullness at all at once but as professor g p muzumdar has ably shown in his small but informative book vanaspati that vruksha ayurveda became prevalent as a distinct branch of positive knowledge as early as the arthashastra of kautilya expressly referring to it the contents of the then vruksha ayurveda were much smaller in scope than what turned out to be the latest development in 13th century ce then one finds frequent references to the science of herbal wellness in ancient indian literature to cite a few the gruhya sutras the kautilya arthashastra the krushi parashara the kamandakiya niti sar shukra niti the manusmruti the buddhist jatakas the puranas like agni matsya varaha padma etc the bruhat samhita of varaha mihir sharangdhara paddhati of sharangdhara etc no doubt the literature mentioned above has definitely a flavor of science but even the literary works like mahabharata the bhagavata classical poetry and drama also mention about the herbal well being the contents of these texts basically emphasize economic political and socio religious aspects still 
this subject which is so widely spread into so many branches of knowledge and so continuously preserved by tradition in a period spread over thousands of years must have a deep rooted and firm foundation in the culture itself in the form of a systematic and independently developed branch of science. However, it is very unfortunate to record here after a deep study of this branch, Dr. Muzumdar opines that as many other sciences, the science of plant life in original is practically lost. A reconstruction of a complete science at the present stage of our knowledge is out of the question. From the above discussion, it is clear that one has to gather together the fragmented references and think of a text as a scientific treatise. And thus now, I will come to the second part of my paper and present some information about and from the available text of Vruksha Ayurveda. On the outer sphere, it may be mentioned that Vruksha Ayurveda is a small versified treatise consisting of 325 stanzas composed in Sanskrit somewhere in 7th century AD and translated into English by Dr. Nalini Sadle for the first time in 1996. It is published by Asian Agro History Foundation. The text is accompanied by important comments from the three scholars in the field and their comments will be referred to in the course of time. The title Vruksha Ayurveda is a compounded word that can be split as Vrukshanam Ayushaha Vedaha, the knowledge of plant life. The word Veda in the title raises the text to the sublime and serene status of Vedic lore. Coming to the contents of the text, after saluting Ganesha, the text starts with the glorification of trees and tree planting. Surapala, the author, refers to several texts written on the topic earlier and recognizes indebtedness to their authors. The well-being of the herbal world constitutes the topics such as procuring, preserving, and treating the seeds before planting, preparing pits for the planting saplings, selection of soil, method of watering, nourishments and fertilizers, plant diseases and plant protection from internal and external disorders. It also deals with the layouts of gardens, agriculture and horticultural wonders, and also with groundwater resources. The detailed study of all these topics clearly shows that no stone is left unturned. Thus, Surapala is glorified with the title Vruksha Vidya Varenya. It will not be out of place to mention that the text is a fine blend of science and traditional faith in deities. One finds various references to the deities propitiated with different leaves of trees, such as Bilva, Tulasi, etc., Lord Shankara and Lord Krishna, respectively, become happy if they are offered these leaves to them and grant a boon to the devotee. The scientist author also fixes the directions of plantation of trees as in human Vastu Shastra, certain directions are specified for certain blocks for a certain purpose, such as the kitchen in the Agneya direction, etc. So also, the author carefully thinks of the required sunlight and shadow to determine the direction and proper placing for planting. The verses of the work are systematically arranged under various heads, but are not separately titled, enveloping all important topics related to plants and herbs. What is important is that it is declared that planting trees is the means to attain the four goals of life and this toss thought is stressed as truth. Surapala associates some trees with specific gods, as I have said earlier. The idea behind this association in our tradition is the preservation 
of the species of the trees for the balancing of the environment and to use their medicinal properties for human health. It is well known fact that in ancient India, even scientific thought has a religious garb. A common man, though not aware of science, follows the traditions and conventions. Tulasi is an air purifier and the bilva leaves and fruits have medicinal properties. So these trees are to be protected. At the same time, the offering of leaves of bilva or blossom of mango, which is offered to Shiva on Mahara, Mahashivratri day, is restricted by specifying a particular day, say bilva on Monday, etc. So the person is not permitted to snatch the leaves in extra quantity and thus the convention is popularized as ek bilva shivarpanam. Only one leaf is sufficient to destroy the sins of three birds. An important point in Surapala Stitais is the treatment of seeds before sowing. Most of the time, he prescribes sprinkling milk on the seeds, smearing them with mustard and ash of sesams, and also prescribes ample use of honey and cow dung. The seeds treated in this way and sown carefully bear abundant flowers and fruits of excellent quality. Through research in planting trees and herbs, ancient sages might have experimented a lot with milk, honey, cow dung, etc. to check their effects on different types of seeds and then prescribed as stated above. In addition to this, the author suggests that the worship of Vastu Devata before sowing the seeds is important. He also suggests specific constellations and a particular day of a week to sow the seeds. The thought behind all this prescription is that the nature with its stars and planets and the environmental condition should be conducive to planting and it is called Muhurta in Muhurta Shastra and also in practice. Thus, the text of Ruksha Ayurveda is a religio-scientific text with a stress on environmental protection. While describing the method of planting, he expects an even and soft ground accessible to water and prefers land covered with green trees and specifies the distance between the two plants. If planted at a far distance, there is danger of strong winds, but if planted far closer than two, three, four arms length, there is no yield. The pit should be prepared well in advance. The length and breadth and depth of pits should be a form or measure uniformly. He presents varied details about the planting and transplanting of trees. The transplanting needs more care than planting. He also records the designs for planting. The trees as mandapa, canopy, nandiyavarta, quadrangle with the opening to the west, swastika, famous diagram of religious significance, chaturastra, square, sarvatobhadra, a square enclosing a circle, vithi, a line, nikunja, an arbor, and punjaka, multitude or cluster. The fruit yielding and flower yielding trees should be at the center and other trees around them. They should be planted in pairs and they too should be encircled by a trench. All this care is to be taken for the protection of them, especially in their initial stage. The trees alone on the earth give happiness both here and hereafter. The word taru for vruksha is derived from the Sanskrit root tru, which means to cross or to protect. Since they save us from abject poverty, they are named as taravaha. Ananta daridrya taranaha iti taravaha. Trees must be protected vigilantly from the mist, storm, smoke, fire, and spider. Then there is a long discussion on the nourishment of plants. Different kinds of mixtures are prescribed as nourishments, especially the liquids. Milk, honey, ghee are the common ingredients, but even excreta, marrow of bones, 
flesh, brain and blood of a boar mixed with water, which is called kunapa, is also prescribed. In addition to this, seemingly awkward objects like the fat and flesh of fish, ram, goat and other horned animals are also to be stored for this purpose. The kunapa is highly nourishing for the trees. Here, a comment by Sp uh, Surapala speaks a ton about the experiments by the ancient scientists. He said, it is stated by the ancient ages, and I, that is Surapala, repeat it hereafter, verifying the same. Verification is an important part of any scientific treatise. Though one is not getting any information, or very less information about the experiments that the ancients have done, it is sure that before making the statements, they were to experiment repeatedly and then come to the conclusion. We do not know about their laboratories, the apparatus they have used. We also do not know whether they have repeated, re-repeated, reworked or revisited their experiments but the final results are the wonders and are established as theories. Like a newborn baby, the newly planted trees also need extra care. The treatment depends mainly upon two things. First is the type of land in which the plants are growing. And secondly, the season in which the nourishing material is to be used. Then he gives details of that, which now I am going to omit. But the important part is that the human babies have different physical conditions and require different types of treatments, so are the plants, requiring different types of treatments at different times. As watering, weeding out the grass in the vicinity and around the plants is also an important part of nourishment. It should be dug out properly so that the nourishing material should reach the plants and the grass should not swallow it. Smoking the plants is another important activity in plant care. The plants yield a rich reward in form of flowers and fruits in a very short period when smoked with a mixture of plantain leaves, white mustard seeds and a small tiny variety of fish. The flowers of the Arjuna tree and flesh of the hair added to the combination of antiseptic vidanga powder and turmeric are beneficial in smoking. Then he speaks of different treatments for creepers, mango trees, coconut trees, as they differ from each other. After the discussion of nourishment, there is the discussion of various injuries and ailments to the trees. What is important is the theory of Tridhatu in human Ayurveda is applied to the plants too in Vruksha Ayurveda. On this topic, Dr. Sadle notes that the basic principle Ayurveda of Ayurveda is the Tridhatu theory according to which a perfect balance of three humors, that is Kapa, Pitta and Vata, signify good health and any imbalance indicates a lack of it among the human beings. If Vruksha Ayurveda is a science concerning the trees, it should also, in order to justify its title, make the same Tridhatu theory applicable to the trees. Curiously enough, the Bruhat Samhita, which has a chapter Vruksha, Ayud, Vruksha Ayurveda, does not even refer to this theory. Upavina Vinoda mentions it and makes it applicable to trees but the treatment is inexhaustive and unsystematic with the symptoms and remedies mixed up. It is only in Vruksha Ayurveda of Surapala that we find a more satisfactory application and a systematic exposition of the Tridhatu theory as applied to plants. Dr. Nene on this point says, it is very significant that the physiology of trees is considered similar to those of humans and therefore, classifying the internal and external disorders into vata, kapha, and pitta kinds as had been done in the case of humans. 
I shall explain this point in brief. The diseases of trees are of two types, internal and external. The internals are those which are caused by the three humors, as I have said, and the external ones are those which are caused by insects, cold water, rails, etc. He therefore suggests that the trees should be provided with warmth by dusting fire ashes tied in a piece of cloth to eliminate मैम अनम्यूट कर लीजिए अपने आप को अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ प्लीज यू हैव बीन म्यूटेड इज इट ओके नाउ नाउ इट्स ओके ओके सो आई वाज एक्सप्लेनिंग द डिसीजेस ऑफ ट्रीज एंड इन दैट केस आई वाज सेइंग दैट the mantra or prayers or rituals practiced systematically completely destroy these nuisances coming to the internal diseases which are caused by the imbalance of humors he presents a long list of remedies for each factor of the tree the diseases caused by vata are due to the arid land on account of excessive supply of dry or pungent matters these diseases are thinness and crookedness of the trunk the appearance of knots on the trunk or leaves and the fruits bearing hard with less juice or less sweetness the diseases of kapha type occur in winter and spring if the trees are excessively watered with materials that are sweet oily sour or cold these diseases are paleness dwarfing of leaves tastelessness prematurity of fruits and the tree taking too long time to bear fruits due to the imbalance of kapha element the trees ooze out even without wounds if wrong treatment is given corresponding diseases of vata type result the diseases of pitta type occur at the end of summer if the clouds disappear and the trees are excessively watered with materials like bitter sour salty or strong the word pitta has come from the sanskrit word pita meaning yellow in short jaundice as seen in humans is also seen in the trees such diseases are to be treated with cool and sweet substances so also they are to be watered with a decoction of milk honey yashti madhu and madhuka which gives relief from pitta diseases to summarize the point it may be said that vidanga sisam mustard milk ghee honey ashes and smoke are natural and effective remedies there are also physical injuries to the trees and plants such as breaking or burning of branches but that they can be restored by special treatments the wounds of the trees are healed by the treatment of anointing with the pest of the bark of nyagrodha or udumbara tree many such elements and remedies to them are discussed by surapala and a few of them are mentioned in this paper after reading this topic on elements and remedies one wonders to see the use of material for the cure of diseases and one tree helping the other tree to get rid of its elements the trees even have a cordial relation with each other and the medicinal quality of one tree cures the disease of the other what is surapala's contribution is that he has experimented to find out which tree with its powder or extract or juice is useful for which disease of the trees and plants he also has prescribed all natural products as remedies and similarly with the ayurvedic treatment in which these four are used as anupanas the core drinks the vruksha ayurveda also expects the same rasadarangini the latest rasagrantha 
has explained the term anupana as follows. Sahapana or anupana is a liquid form taken along with the main drug and which can facilitate easy in disintegration, absorption and uniform distribution of medicine all over the body. Hence, that liquid is called anupana. However, the plants which are not cured by any of the above mentioned methods are to be transplanted at other special sites. There is a long discussion from verses 223 to 292 about the horticultural wonders. This chapter is called Vichitra Adhyaya and the topic is Druma Vichitri Karanam. Vichitra is something that is bizarre, very odd or strange. It is also something that is curious and unusual or difficult to understand. In the first four stanzas of this group, a list is given of the wonders that Surapala expects. It is bearing flowers and fruits around the year that is out of season, producing fragrance in those flowers which are basically have no fragrance, changing the test and color, changing the nature of the flowers and fruits, changing the fragrance, arresting the fragrance, producing flowers on non-flowering creepers, transforming the trees into creepers, dwarfing the trees, mixing longevity of ripeness, longevity of crops, destruction and quick rejuvenation of plants, quick production of fruits, increasing the size of flowers and fruits at its very appearance and transformation into another species. After giving the list, he explains different methods to obtain the expected changes. It is not possible to mention all of them, but two or three may be mentioned as specimen. Kushmanda, Vartaka, Patolaka, etc. produced from healthy seeds cultivated with the marrow of a female boar and also nourished with the sprinkling of the same marrow mixed in water always produce seedless fruits. A treat a tree that normally produces pungent fruits start producing fruits sweet like nectar if thickly smeared at the root with the pest of mixture made of vidanga, yashti, yava, milk and jaggery. The white flowers of a tree turn into a golden color if the tree is watered with a mixture of turmeric powder, kimshuka, cotton seed, manjishtha and lodra etc. Though it is interesting to listen to all these things, the time is not permitting me to go into the details. And what I want to say is, with all this, the Vruksha Ayurveda becomes a multidisciplinary study where not only the trees are studied, but the anatomy of various animals is also studied. The parts of their body are used for producing wonders in trees and all this is experimented on. In this way, the phrase Jeevo Jeevasya Jeevanam not only means one animal is the food of the other, but also proves that living things are interconnected with each other. Then comes the topic of pleasure gardens. There is a one full text entitled Upavana Vinoda devoted to this topic, which means the art of enjoyment by gardening. I will not go into the details, but I will just summarize this topic. What I mean to say is the description of these gardens shows that the poetic genius of Surapala has come down to his pain. He writes, an extremely long pond should be constructed there with its water free of aquatic creatures, easy to get in with pleasure boats and with flowering trees around it. It should be dark with sprouting lotus leaves and at a place having blue lotuses, resembling to the eyes of beautiful women, etc. This topic in a way is remoted, remotely related to the well-being of the herbal world, but the text of Ruksha Ayurveda does not miss any topic about the trees and plants and their beauty. This beauty solely depends upon the well-being of the herbal world because 
the swastha trees and plants can only beautify the surroundings. Thus, pleasure from the gardens can come only if the plants and herbs are healthy and their natural properties are in full bloom. Thus, the topic is not out of place. Then he also dealt with natural indications of groundwater, etc. Lastly, he discusses the plant indicators for crops and animal production. See, for example, he notes that where there is a Nyagrodha tree, the land is fit for producing barley crop, etc. In this way, there are five more verses explaining the fitness of land for particular crops. In the concluding verse, that is 325, it is said, the Surapala, the expert of medicine, whose glorious success has spread all over the world, composed this work of Ayurveda of trees out of interest. And after mastering various skills of profession under the patronage of King Bhimapala, who was the leader of the valiant. As a contribution of Rukshayurveda as a text, many commentators have written very good words about it. Shriyut K. L. Mehra comments with the biodiversity perspective and says that the scientific identification of Sanskrit plant names, the therapeutic and various folk uses of the plants, beliefs about different plants species mentioned in this book constitute important aspects of conservation and uses of plant diversity. Such knowledge, especially folk beliefs and other ethno-botanical uses of plants would help us understand that the plant, man and environmental relationship for preserving biodiversity and knowledge base for the use of future generations of mankind. Then there are comments from Dr. S. M. Viramani. He was the principal scientist in agroclimatology and the text that, that is important from agronomic aspect. Now, Dr. what is important about Dr. Viramani that he informs that even today in the agroecological studies, they use a similar classification of the soil as added marshy in their agroecological studies and add to it the ordinary lands or uplands. The text also recommends land suitable for horticultural productions. Now, verse 9 of the text shows well understanding of the place of horticulture in ecology at both the places, at the field scale and the home garden scale too. So also, the saints and philosophers of the time extolled people to grow more trees. It has become the slogan of the day. Now, as coming to the last part of the conclusion part, I may say, as the literary merit of Ruksha Yurveda, it may be mentioned that it uses the highly developed and refined form of classical Sanskrit. It is simple, lucid, and has a pleasant flow. The compounds are used, are huge in number, but do not hamper the flow of expression. As it is, there is not much scope for literary embellishments, but one finds the poetic talent of Surapala matching with the best of classical poetry in Sanskrit. And as an illustration of it, is 147 to 151 verses can be the evidence. It is the description of blossoming trees at the loving glance or a gentle kick of a charming young girl. Such poetic descriptions is an oasis in the desert of any science. Considering the time and space limit, I shall summarize the entire discussion in a self-composed Sanskrit verse as follows. Ayurvedo Manushyanam Tatha Vai Vruksha Praninam Bodhayatyeva Tatvam Tu Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam Sura Palena Granthesmin Vruksha Ayurveda Namake Sandarbha Purva Surinam Nirdishta Vinayena Vai Binas Padatvat Prakhyate Vidvata Kavitecha Vai Eka Samsthe Hidrushete 
सूरपाले विचक्षणे यथा रोगा उपायाश्च मनुष्याणां त्रिदोषत एवमेव हि वृक्षाणां इति तेन चिकित्सित वृक्ष एक संवर्ध्य दशपुत्र वै पर्यावरण समृद्ध्य सन्देश स प्रदिष्टवा नवा तम सूरपाल निसर्गाभ्यास तत्पर एषा कविभ्य पूर्वेभ्य प्रणति पुनः श्लोक षटक सारांश प्रतिपाद्य तथा यहम उपसंहरोमी व्याख्यान विरमाम्यति विस्तरात् नमो नमः धन्यवाद when i assigned this text to you i hadn't even read it but i knew that nobody can do better than yourself and you did a wonderful presentation out of this text and you brought it into a wider perspective right from the rigveda up to the modern problems that we have for vriksh growing trees we say that grow everyone should grow one tree at least and you have presented this perspective in the with reference to ayurveda and we had a session on nature centered treatment in ayurveda what best can be illustrated than the presentation that you have made now it is open for discussion i am thankful to you thank you so much any questions any questions comments or observations no okay shall we go ahead to the last presentation so we go to the last 17th presentation in this two days conference we had already had 16 presentations and there were scholars of ayurveda there were scientists like bhavna parashar ji and sarika chaturvedi ji there were practitioners of ayurveda like ram kumar kutti ji ram manohar ji and many others there were medical doctors like rama jay sundar ji and ruby pavankar ji social scientists and gerontologists like mala shankar kapoor mala kapoor shankar das sanskrit scholars like professor uma vaidya engineers like rajiv vasudevan ji yoga expert like dr manjunath ji and out of these 17 seven were women participants which was asked to me when i sent a proposal to the tf3 coordinator office they told me that there are less women participants so i requested ruby pavankar and uma ji for presenting their papers and they agreed not only agreed but they lent dignity and depth to this conference thank you so much now comes vaidya tara chand sharma he is a practicing vaidya in delhi he has a wide knowledge of the shastra ayurveda he has got many awards from delhi sanskrit academy rajasthan shri samman shatabdi maharshi samman lifetime achievement rashtriya ayurveda vidyapeeth he varisht adhyapak samman and he is affiliated with many institutions he is member of akhil bharatiya dharma niyantrana board antarrashtriya ayurveda sammelan akhil bharatiya ayurveda visheshagya and for the last 50 years every day he is examining free of cost several diseased persons although he also treats many of at many places he is going to a hospital in south of delhi and also where he lives today also he said you have kept the time when my patients will be coming to me there are some who can come only on sunday but i asked him about ashwayurveda and he said i have a lot of material in this respect and now i request vaidya tara chand ji sharma to kindly present his paper on pashu chikitsa in ayurveda i am glad that these two uma ji and vaidya tara chand ji have already submitted their papers also
वैद्य जी आप जुड़ गए हैं नमस्कार नमस्ते जी आप शुरू कीजिए जी विघ्न भूता यदा रोगा प्रारुद भूता शरीरी नाम तपोपवासा अध्ययन ब्रह्म तरी अवतायुषा तस्ायुष पुण्यतमो वेदो वेद विदाबत वक्षते यन मनुष्य लोकयोरभ्योरपी आयुर्वेद का प्रादुर्भाव ब्रह्मा से महर्षियों द्वारा जब पृथ्वी पर लाया गया तो ब्रह्मा जी ने कहा ये आयुर्वेद सभी प्राणियों के लिए है आयुर्वेद के साथ अन्य प्राणियों के लिए है ऐसा उन्होंने कहा क्योंकि उन्होंने लिखा स्वयं आयुर्वेद चरक लिखते हैं स्वयं आयुर्वेद शाश्वत निर्देशित अनादित्वा स्वभाव संसिद्ध लक्षण भाव स्वभाव निश्चित्वाच तो उन्होंने आगे एक श्लोक मुझे याद है महाभारत का न तो हम काम राज्य न स्वर्ग न पुनर्भव काम दुख तप्ता नाम प्राणी नाम अर्तिनाशनम प्राणी नाम अर्तिनाशनम मीन्स ये सभी प्राणियों के लिए आया है इसमें तो वृक्ष आयुर्वेद का वर्णन ये आपने अभी आ, सुना उमा जी से तो मैं भी अभी एक उपन विनोद सारंग धर पद्धति का पुस्तक है उपन विनोद उसमें 400 सौ श्लोक है वृक्ष आयुर्वेद पे उसका अनुवाद मैंने किया अभी शायद सेंट्रल कौंसिल से प्रिंट होने जा रहा हो वो मांग रहे हैं तो वो तो बहुत अच्छा बताया उन्होंने बाकी इसमें बृहद संगीता में इसका एक चैप्टर अलग से वृक्ष आयुर्वेद का अलग भी है बहुत पुराणों में भी हमारे आया है अब मैं आपको अश्वाय पशु चिकित्सा पे कुछ मेरा पेपर गया हुआ है लेकिन मैं पढ़ रहा हूँ अभी आयुर्वेद शाश्वत है तथा वैदिक काल से आज तक मानव पशु पक्षी एवं वनस्पतियों के स्वास्थ्य एवं रोग दूर करने में निरंतर चला आ रहा है देव वैद्य अश्विनी कुमार द्वारा मनुष्यों के साथ पशुओं की चिकित्सा का भी उल्लेख प्राप्त है उपनिषद कोशिकीय सूत्र अग्निपुराण वायुपुराण स्मृतियों एवं आयुर्वेद संगीताओं में पशु चिकित्सा का उल्लेख है चरक में के सिद्धि स्थान में पशुओं के रोगों में विशेष बस्तियों का उल्लेख का उनके स्वरूप द्रव्य एवं नेत्र प्रमाण का भी वर्णन है यद्यपि सुश्रुत में साक्षात चिकित्सा का उल्लेख दृष्टिगत नहीं होता तथापि अनेक प्रसंगों में सुश्रुत संगीता के रचयिता सुश्रुत को शाली होत्र का पुत्र बताया है ये सूत्र अन्य भी हो सकते हैं अथवा इन्होंने अश्व आयुर्वेद का ग्रंथ पृथक लिखा हो जो प्राप्त नहीं हो तो प्रसंग में सिद्धोपदेश संग्रह है अश्वैद्य का उसमें लिखा शाली होते न गर्गे न सुश्रे ने सुश्रुते न भाषितम तत्व यद वाजशास्त्र से सत्सर्वेदम दूसरा है महाभारत का अनुशासन पर्व का शाली हो परिप्रक्षति एवं प्रश्न साली होत्रो अभाषत है और साली होत्रे में तो साफ लिखा साली होत्रे प्रक्षत पुत्रा सुश्रुत संगीता अब ये सुश्रुत ने लिखा पढ़ा है ये हम कह नहीं सकते लेकिन वर्णन इसमें शास्त्रों में आया है इसी का प्रसंग जो है गरुड़ पुराण में और वायु पुराण में भी आया है इसी दृष्टि से सुश्रुत का गवायुर्वेद अश्वायुद में भी से संबंध बताया गया अग्नि पुराण मत्स्य पुराण में पशु चिकित्सा का वर्णन है कोटिल अर्थात में पशु अध्यक्षों जैसे गो अध्यक्ष अश्वाध्यक्ष गजाध्यक्ष तथा पशु चिकित्सा का वर्णन मिलता है महाभारत में साली होत्र का वर्णन है युक्ति कल्पत रूप में अश्व वृषभ आदि के लक्षण एवं चिकित्सा का वर्णन है अश्व चिकित्सा पर अनेक स्वतंत्र ग्रंथ मिलते हैं जो प्रकाशित एवं प्राप्त पांडुलिपियों में अभी भी पुस्तकालयों में संरक्षित है जैसे अशु वैद्य जयदत्त का अश्व शास्त्र नकुल तंजोत वो पुस्तकालय में है अशु वैद्य दीपंकर का सिद्धोपदेश संग्रह गण का शाली होत्र भोज शाली होत्र डॉक्टर ई डी कुलकर्णी पूना उन्नीस में संपादित भाई लीलावली मल्लीनाथ द्वारा उद्धृत अश्व चिकित्सा नल द्वारा साली होत्र संभ्रमण कल्हण द्वारा सारंग दर तुरंग परीक्षा एवं बाजी चिकित्सा का वर्णन हमारे शास्त्रों में आया है अश्व वैदिक में विशेष रूप से इस संबंध में ग्रंथ अश्व घोष के पुत्र साली होत्र ने बनाया था जो सालापुर पाणिनी की जन्मभूमि का निवासी था इसे हयाव आयुर्वेद 
सूरग आयुर्वेद ग्रंथ अश्व आयुर्वेद तथा थाली युक्त संगीता के नाम से जाना जाता है ये ग्रंथ अपूर्ण रूप से प्राप्त है इसमें बारह सौ श्लोक है एवं आठ स्थानों में अष्टांग अशुभ का वर्णन पहले भाग में घोड़ों का स्वरूप गुण नस्ल रंग अनेक जातिया इनकी आयु का पता लगाने का विधान घोड़ों के नियंत्रण के उपाय एवं राजाओं के उपयुक्त तो घोड़ों के खरीदने का नियम भी स्पष्ट किए दूसरे भाग के में निरूपण की रीतियों का उल्लेख विभिन्न बीमारियों जैसे ज्वर अंतर सूर आंख के रोग अतिशार हिचकी तमा पीलिया विश्व विज्ञान आदि का वर्णन तीसरे भाग में भ्रूण निर्माण गर्भाशय भ्रूण विकास कठिन प्रसव एवं कठिन प्रसव और प्रजन अंगों के रोगों का वर्णन किया गया चौथे भाग में मुख एवं जीव के रोग तथा उपचारों का वर्णन है बाधी तथा अजीर्ण एवं चारा न खाने के कारण का वर्णन है पांचवें भाग में घोड़ों पर विभिन्न ग्रहों का प्रभाव एवं विभिन्न रोगों के साथ अस्थि भग्न का वर्णन है छठे भाग में नव ग्रहों के प्रभाव तो उपाय सातवें सातवें भाग में दूध दूध शराब नमक आदि पदार्थों से उत्पन्न उपद्रव एवं बस्ती का वर्णन तथा आठवें भाग में घोड़ों के शरीर की रेखाओं एवं उनके शको मृत्यु लक्षण विविध औषधियों का वर्णन किया गया है जिनमें त्रिफला गुग्गुल हरण अदरक सरसों लाख आदि का विशेष उल्लेख है इनके अध्यायों का उल्लेख अग्नि पुराण में भी है इसी प्रकार मत्स्य एवं गरुड़ पुराण में भी अशु चिकित्सा का वर्णन आता है इस ग्रंथ में फारसी अरबी तिब्बती आदि अनेक शास्त्रों के अनुवाद भी किए गए हैं इसका फारसी में जो अनुवाद हुआ उसका नाम कुतुब उल मुल्क है जिसका काल तेरह सौ नवासी वन थ्री एट नाइन ईस्वी बताया जाता है हाली होते अश्वशाला नामक संस्कृत ग्रंथ की प्रति मद्रास में गणरचित हस्तलिखित प्रति नेपाल के पोथी खाने में भी है इसके अतिरिक्त दीपंकर का अशुवैद्य शास्त्र भोज का थाली होते कल रंग रचित थाली होते समुच्चय आदि हस्तलिखित प्रतियां भी प्राप्त हुई है बंगाल की रायल स्पेसिफिक सोसाइटी में भी दो ग्रंथ दो ग्रंथ प्रकाशित किए हैं जिनमें एक प्रकाशन पुरी द्वारा रचित पशु वैद्य तथा दूसरा नल अश्व चिकित्सा है सूर्य की प्रति में निदान एवं चिकित्सा दोनों का वर्णन है साथ ही आयुर्वेद औषधियों का भी वर्णन है महाभारत में साली होत्र का अनेक स्थलों पर उल्लेख है लोक में भी एक कहावत है कि घोड़ा अड़ा क्यों रोटी सड़ी क्यों पान पान जड़ा क्यों सड़ा क्यों इन तीनों का उत्तर है इनको फिराया नहीं फेरना पड़ता है सर घोड़ों के स्वास्थ्य के लिए उनको प्रतिदिन फेरना चाहिए और दौड़ाना चाहिए ऐसा लिखा नकुल के तस्व चिकित्सा आज भी उपलब्ध है इस पुस्तक का नाम सालियोत्र भी है वात्स्य नामक ऋषि की भी पशु चिकित्सा के एक आचार्य थे जयदेव ने भी काय चिकित्सा पर एक ग्रंथ लिखा था मल्लीनाथ सूरी ने रघुवंश की टीका में है लीलावली के अशु विषय श्लोक उद्धृत किए भोज की एक प्रति अशु चिकित्सा पर भी है संप्रति भोज प्रणित साली होत्र डॉक्टर ई बी कुलकर्णी पकन कॉलेज पूना उन्नीस सौ तिरपन में संपादित है युक्ति कल्प दरु युक्ति कल्प ग्रंथ में अशु विषय आदि पशुओं का उल्लेख है लक्षण एवं चिकित्सा स्थित भोज के भोज ने किया है ये कलकत्ता ऐसी सोसाइटी द्वारा प्रकाशित है दीपंकर प्रणीत अशु वैद्य शास्त्र भी अशु चिकित्सा विषय के ग्रंथ है कवि कल्प लता में तेरहवें वर्ग में पशुओं के उत्तम लक्षणों का उनके अनेक जातियों का उल्लेख है सारण घर तुरंत परीक्षा एवं बाजी चिकित्सा का रचयिता है वन एट नाइन टू अठारह सौ बानवे ईस्वी में राजा इंद्र सेन का साली होत्र पर आधारित पशु चिकित्सा विषय सार संग्रह नामक एक लघु ग्रंथ मिला है प्रवर एवं अवर प्रकार के घोड़ों की पहचान आयु निर्णायक संकेतों के सही युक्त मान वर्णन नकुल प्रणीत अशु शास्त्र एस गोपालन द्वारा संपादित सरस्वती महल ग्रंथागार तंजोर उन्नीस सौ बावन द्वारा प्रकाशित आज भी बाजार में प्राप्त है साली होत्र भारतीय चिकित्सा में ये जन्म पशु चिकित्सा का जन्मदाता साली होत्र का जन्म संप्रति अफगानिस्तान देश के कांधार गंधार नामक शहर के निकट सालापुर नामक स्थान पर हुआ इसी जगह महावीकरण कारिणी का भी जन्म हुआ नकुल के अनुसार यह हैोष के पुत्र थे इंडिया ऑफिस लाइब्रेरी लंदन में 
सुरक्षित खाली होकर के अपूर्ण हस्त लिखित एक प्रति के अनुसार ये आयुर्वेद शल्य शास्त्र के आचार्य सुश्रुत के पिता थे लिखा यथोवाच पुनः पुत्र साली होत सुश्रुत है शिष्योपनयन नाम सुश्रुत आय सुमय किंतु सुश्रुत संगीता में ऐसा कोई प्रसंग दृष्टि उत्तर नहीं होता आप इनके विपरीत सुश्रुत को विश्वामित्र का पुत्र कहा गया है निसंदेह साली होत्र का वही समय मानना चाहिए जो सुश्रुत का है सुश्रुत का नौ सौ ईस्वी पूर्व माना है जिन ऋषियों ने इस विज्ञान को व्यवस्थित किया उनमें साली उत्तर का नाम सर्वप्रथम है ऐसा कहा जाता है कि उन्होंने ये विज्ञान समस्त विद्याओं के मूल स्रोत ब्रह्मा से प्राप्त किया और तत्पश्चात इसे अपने शिष्यों को पढ़ाया साली होत्र का व्याख्यान आयुर्वेद अश्वायुर्वेद तथा सुरक्ष शास्त्र के नाम से प्रसिद्ध हुआ प्रायोगिक दृष्टि से अग्निपुराण अध्याय दो सौ छियासी अठासी इक्यानवे में गो आश्रम हस्ती के विविध रोगों के अद्भुत चिकित्सा का उल्लेख है गरुड़ पुराण में उपयुक्त विषय का वर्णन है गण द्वारा पढ़ित अश्वायुर्वेद में साली होत्र को उद्धृत किया है शुक्राचार्य द्वारा पढ़ित नीति सार में उपयुक्त विषय का विशद की विशद चर्चा है राजा नल की एक उपाधि अशोभित भी थी नकुल सहदेव की भी ऊपर चर्चा की गई है इस प्रकार साली होत्र रचित संगीता साली होत्र संगीता आठ स्थानों में विभक्त होकर उपयुक्त वर्णन अनुसार है आयुर्वेद का ये प्रामाणिक इतिहास में और प्रियवत जी द्वारा लिखित आयुर्वेद के वैज्ञानिक इतिहास में इनका वर्णन है गजायुर्वेद में या हस्तायुर्वेद पशु चिकित्सा विज्ञान की एक महत्वपूर्ण शाखा है इसका प्रमुख ग्रंथ है पाल का प्रेरित हस्तायुर्वेद ये आनंद आश्रम संस्कृत सीरीज पूना से अठारह चौदह में मूल रूप में प्रकाशित हुआ इसी शाखा पर दूसरा ग्रंथ दस शास्त्र है जो पालका पर द्वारा ही प्रणीत कहा जाता है ये सरस्वती महल लाइब्रेरी इंदौर से उन्नीस सौ अठावन ईस्वी में के एस सुब्रमण्य स्वामी द्वारा संपादित होकर प्रकाशित है पालकाप्य का जन्म स्थान काल अष्टायुर्वेद में पालकाप्य को सामगायन ऋषि का पुत्र कहा गया है जो राजा रोमपाद द्वारा जंगली हाथियों को बस में करने के लिए मानव उपयोग में लाने के लिए आमंत्रित किए गए थे राजा रोमपाद भगवान राम के पिता दशरथ के समकालीन अंग देश भागलपुर के राजा थे रोम लोम या रोमपाद चंपा के राजा थे बर्मिंगम ने प्राचीन चंपा की पहचान आधुनिक पत्थर घाट को जो बिहार प्रांत के आधुनिक भागलपुर नामक नगर से 40 किलोमीटर दूर स्थित है से की है चंपा अंग देश की राजधानी थी जो प्रथुलाक्ष के पुत्र राजा चंपा के नाम से अभिहित हुई त्रिकांड शेष के लेखक ने सुश्रुत संगीता के आजुक देशता धनवंतरी देवदास के साथ पालकाप्य का एक स्थापित किया इनके अनुसार सुश्रुत ने पशु चिकित्सा विज्ञान की भी धनवंतरी से पढ़ा पर ऐसा उल्लेख आयुर्वेद के ऐसा उल्लेख तो सुश्रुत में कहीं नहीं मिलता इसके इसमें इसमें भी कोई संदेह नहीं कि पालकाप्य ने सुश्रुत की शैली पर ही स्थान विवर्त किया इसलिए यह अनुमान लगाया जाता है कि पालका पर ग्रंथ भी एक हजार ईस्वी पूर्व के लगभग लिखा हो गया होगा लेकिन संगीता काल में इस देश के विद्वानों द्वारा सभी क्षेत्रों में उन्नति कर संगीताओं की रचना की गई थी जिस प्रकार मानव स्वास्थ्य रक्षण हेतु आयुर्वेद के आठों अंगों पर स्वतंत्र रचना की गई थी उसी प्रकार पशुओं के लिए भी अलग अलग विद्वानों द्वारा अलग अलग रचनाएं इन्हीं अंगों में की गई पार्क का अस्वायुर्वेद पाल काप्य का अश्वायुर्वेद का प्रवर्तक जिस प्रकार से साली होता है उसी प्रकार हस्तायुर्वेद के प्रवर्तक पाल काप्य मुनि है इनकी दो रचनाएं उपलब्ध है हस्तायुर्वेद और गज शास्त्र इसका उल्लेख बृहस्पति नीलकंठ आदि ने आदि के ग्रंथों में भी है लोमपाल के पाल काप्य को हाथी को बस में करने की विद्या सिखाई थी पाल काप्य का हस्तायुर्वेद एवं वृद्ध ग्रंथ है ये पूना की आजाद पूना के आजाद श्री आश्रम में छपा है इसमें हाथियों के लक्षण रोग की चिकित्सा पकड़ने की विधि का वर्णन किया गया है इनमें चार भाग है महारोग स्थान शुद्ध रोग स्थान शल्य स्थान उत्तर स्थान इन चारों में 160 अध्याय है जिनमें एक रोगों का वर्णन किया गया है महाभारत काल में हाथियों को पालने में पकड़ने की विद्या का पता था शताब्दी में पहली शताब्दी छठी सातवीं शताब्दी में आए मैगस्निक 
ने बताया कि भारत में हाथियों को पकड़ने उनके रखने उनके आंतर रोग या दूध का प्रयोग व्रण पर जल और कुत्ते का मांस आस घी आदि का उपचार किया जाता है अशोक के शिला लेखों में इनकी जानकारी मिलती है अतः ईसु पूर्व तीसरी सदी में ये चिकित्सा परिचित होने का प्रमाण है इस प्रकार से अंगदेश गजायुर्वेद और पश्चिमोत्तर प्रदेश अश्वायुर्वेद का केंद्र था गजायुर्वेद के अन्य ग्रंथों का उल्लेख प्राप्त करते हैं बृहस्पति का कृत गज लक्षण नीलकंठ के मातंग लीला हेमादि द्वारा उचित गज दर्पण अब गवायुर्वेद में भी कुछ ग्रंथ प्राप्त नहीं हुए लेकिन इनका उल्लेख प्राप्त होता है अश्वायुर्वेद गजायुर्वेद की तरह गो चिकित्सा संबंधी कोई पुस्तक तो प्राप्त नहीं है परंतु सारंग पद्धति में बकरी तथा गो आदि पशुओं की चिकित्सा का संक्षेप वर्णन किया गया है यद्यपि महाभारत में पांडवों में सहदेव गायदे माने जाते हैं हो सकता है कि सहदेव ने इस विषय में अपना कोई ग्रंथ बनाया हो परंतु यह आज उपलब्ध नहीं है इस प्रकार मृग पक्षी शास्त्र पर भी किसी जैन पंडित हंसदेव की रचना का वर्णन प्राप्त है सोमेश्वर ने मानसोल्लास में गज नग गज अश्व गो तथा खग चिकित्सा का भी ज्ञाता और वैद्यों का उल्लेख किया है उन्होंने लिखा है नराणाम से गजानाम से बाजी नाम से गवाम पी मृगाम से खगाराम से ये जान लेते चिकित्सक है तो महर्षि हारित ने पशु चिकित्सा का यहाँ वर्णन किया है वहाँ इनकी नारियों का वर्णन किया है और इसके साथ ही उसने लिखा है कि मनुष्य की तरह घोड़ों में सत्तर हजार हाथियों में अस्सी हजार और गायों में चालीस हजार सिराएं होती है दूसरा इनकी नाड़ी परीक्षा कैसे करें उन लिखा कि गवाम नासा पुटे द्वंद बाजी नाम शरणत गए मुखा नासा कर पूछे सु नागाराम गंड योदय मैंने दोनों गंड स्थल पे इनकी नाड़ी परीक्षा की जाती है इस प्रकार कुछ अंश मिलता है और कुछ आज प्रकाशित होने जा रहा है हम जानते हैं कि पशु चिकित्सा पर आज बड़े बड़े हॉस्पिटल खुल गए हैं लेकिन आयुर्वेद की दृष्टि से जो क्वास जो गुटिका और जो रस बताए गए उनका प्रयोग करने से भी लाभ है तो गाँव में हमने देखा मैंने प्रसारणी पर एक ग्रंथ लिखा द्रव्य गुण में एम करते हुए तो मैंने ये देखा कि राजस्थान में जो ऊँट जब बैठने में तकलीफ पाते हैं तो उनको छिपरा छीप होती है उनके रस की नाल देते हैं तो चलने लग जाता है तो इसका मतलब चिकित्सा गांवों में भी पशुओं की चिकित्सा के जानने वाले थे वो पढ़े लिखे नहीं थे लेकिन चिकित्सा जानते थे इस प्रकार अश्वायुर्वेद का और गजायुर्वेद का आयुर्वेद हमारे शास्त्र में इतिहास में इतना ही वर्णन मिलता है इसके संबंध में अन्य कहीं ग्रंथ हो तो उसका भी हम उल्लेख करके आगे पता करेंगे किस लाइब्रेरी में कहाँ है धन्यवाद धन्यवाद आपने बिल्कुल ही एक नया आयाम प्रस्तुत किया है इस संगोष्ठी में तो फॉर दोज ऑफ माय फ्रेंड्स हु आर फ्रॉम साउथ ऑफ इंडिया डू आई नीड टू प्रेजेंट हिज समरी इन इंग्लिश और इट वाज ही हैज प्रेजेंटेड वेरी ब्रीफ बट वेरी कॉम वेरी ब्रीफ बट वेरी ऑथेंटिक डिस्क्रिप्शन ऑफ द टेक्स दैट आर अवेलेबल ऑन द ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ एनिमल्स लाइक horse then elephant and the names of authors are shalihotra kalak kalak kya hai kalakapya palakapya and shalihotra palakapya and then the brihaspati nilakantha hemadri and harita gajayurveda ashvayurveda and he has also referred to the names of fevers that are found in different animals like elements have pataka jwar horses have abhitap jwar cows have ishwar goats and sheep have pralada and children of elephants they have alasa buffaloes have haridra birds have abhighata and birds also have birds or insects pakshapata tiger has akshiva 
then there are kotara like that he has mentioned about different animals and their treatments and many texts he have listed which are not yet available but which are in the form of manuscripts in different libraries and i present it to the scholars of ayurveda kindly try to find them locate them and edit them translate them so that they become available to the wider audience these are ashva vaidyaka of jayadatta ashva shastra of nakula and he says it is in tanjore library ashva vaidyaka of dipankara siddhopadesha sangraha of gana bhoja bhoj shalihotra this is already edited by dr ed kulkarni in 1953 from pune haya leela wali this was quoted by mallinath and mallinath we know he was the commentator of kalidasa also if he is the same ashva chikitsa by nala shalihotra sambharana by kallana and sharangadhar turang pariksha and vaji chikitsa so there is some valuable material on the treatment of animals presented by vaidya tara chand ji and before him dr uma vaidya has presented another dimension for trees and plants so in this way the nature center treatment of ayurveda was not only limited to human beings and their connection with nature but different aspects of nature different beings other than human beings because whenever we discuss these things lifestyle and values for the well being of world in t20 tf3 it was mentioned that the discussion should not only be human centric it should be interspecies and it should be comprehensive covering the whole world that's why these two papers were added i invited these two scholars to present these papers and they agreed accepted my request i am thankful to uma ji and tara chand ji thank you so much with these i conclude i may seek your permission for all the participants and distinguished scholars who are still joining now before we conclude this conference i request our academic resource officer premchand ji he will propose a formal vote of thanks premchand ji Uh, a very good evening. Uh, on behalf of the institute, I would like to propose a formal vote of thanks. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Professor Nageshwar Rao, Director of the Institute, for delivering welcome address and his constant support and encouragement for organizing this conference at our, our campus. Uh, we are privileged to have with us Professor Shashi Prabha Kumarji, Chairperson IIS, and convener of this program who is instrumental and in, in organizing this conference and hosting the event at IIAS my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to madam chairperson for her gracious presence for two days session and her dynamic leadership and for her excellent presidential address i would like to extend very big thank you madam I thank uh, Dr. P. Ram uh, Manohar Bedia, Research Director, Amrita School of Ayurveda, and Coordinator of the conference for his introductory remarks on the theme of the conference. And also identifying and inviting domain experts and speakers from different parts of the country, and arranging wonderful lectures on appropriate theme and sub theme of the conference thank you very much sir thanks to shri rajesh kotechar ji secretary ayush for his excellent inaugural address we are deeply grateful to our collaborators namely vif and ris new delhi for financial and 
secretarial support for hosting this conference at our campus. I, on behalf of the Institute, wish to thank our guest of honor, Dr. Sachin Chaturvedi Ji, Director General, RIS, and Dr. Arvind Gupta Ji, Director, VIF, for taking out their time from their busy schedule and to be a part of this conference. I, on behalf of the Institute, express my sincere gratitude to both of you, sir, for extending all kinds of supports to make this conference a very grand success. During these two days conference, we have witnessed galaxy of experts and great speakers in the field of Ayurveda who shared their experience and thoughts and views on Ayurveda and holistic well-being. I would like to express my deep sense of gratitude to all the distinguished experts for their wonderful presentation on different dimensions of Ayurveda and topics of immense significance. Our sincere gratitude to all the participants and speakers. The institute will certainly take uh, necessary action to publish the proceeding for larger benefits of the users. I thank Dr. Rohit from VIF, who was constantly in touch with us through telephone and emails for making certain arrangements to make this event be successful. I would also like to thank all the fellows of the Institute, Tagore Fellows, National Fellows and Fellows for their active participation and deliberation in this conference. Last but not the least, I would like to thank my colleagues, Shri Hemra Sharma and Shri Vijay and Shri Ashwini Sharma for their technical support for making this event a very memorable and grand success. Once again, I thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. I, on my personal behalf, I thank everyone right from the sponsors, Prof. Dr. Arvind Gupta, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, VIF, RIS, staff of their institutions. I am thankful to the IIAS staff, our academic resource officer, Shri Premchanji and his team, the system analyst, Ashwini and his team, all the fellows who are present here, all the other staff who are not visible, but who have made it possible. Our director, Nageshwar Raoji, I thank you all. I thank Rohit Krishna from VIF and Dr. Ram Manoharji, who coordinated all the speakers, most of the speakers. And I'm thankful to the speakers, four speakers whom I requested, Mala Kapoor, Ruby Pavankar, Uma Vaidya Ji, and Vaidya Tara Chandra Sharma Ji. So despite all odds, because the conference was to take place in another shape, and many of the speakers were excited to visit Shimla. Actually, that was the reason we tried to convene it at Shimla. Otherwise, it could have been organized in Delhi, although Delhi is not in a, not in a better shape today. But these things are unpredictable, and we were talking of predictive medicine. We can predict medicine, we, but we cannot predict environment, weather, and the conditions that are beyond our control. But beyond our control, the situation was not in our control, but the willpower that we had that survived us through with the support of you all. Thank you each and everyone. I may have missed some name, but I am really grateful to everyone from my core of my heart. Thank you. Namo Namah. Thank you. Thanks to the chair, Thank madam. You. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>